Good morning, and welcome to our first hearing of the full Committee of the 112th Congress. Today's hearing is on the bailout and the foreclosure crisis, and the report, and specifically the report of this Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the SIGTARP. This is the first hearing for both Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings, so I ask all of your indulgence as we go through a number of uh, first-time mistakes that undoubtedly I will make. The Chair uh, notes that, pursuant to the rules, there will not be opening statements. However, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record. Uh, we will now recognize our panel. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. I know this is our first meeting, <coughs> and I just want to make sure we are clear. We had a lengthy discussion on opening the gentleman's state is probably yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to do that. Uh, we had a lengthy discussion yesterday with regard to opening statements, and the chairman, I thought we had reached a, a, a wonderful agreement where the chairman had said that uh, he would uh, provide us notice with regard to opening statements, whether we were giving them or not. Um, and this is our first hearing, and to some of the members, and of course I am, just wondering exactly uh, why we are not having opening statements. And two, uh, we were given notice just uh, about a half an hour ago or uh, so that there would not be opening statements. I am just wondering. Uh, so that just I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair is waiving opening statements, including my own. And as I said, all members will have seven, seven days in order to place their opening statements into the record. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a very personal note, I felt that it was most important on this first hearing to start off by listening to the witnesses uh, as though this, and I know that uh, the, the special IG, <laughs> this is his 20th visit. However, for the purposes of all of us, including the freshmen, uh, I wanted to start off by listening first. Uh, I recognize that uh, tradition is that we hold the members or the witnesses here for sometimes an hour through opening statements. That is a tradition that I intend to break. Uh, that doesn't mean that it, there won't be opening statements in the future, but for this first one, I wanted to make it perfectly clear, if you will, that we are interested in listening to our witnesses first. Uh, and I appreciate the gentleman's parliamentary Chairman, follow, 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 further parliamentary inquiry. Um, pursuant to what you said yesterday, and I have the transcript, will you be giving us uh, more notice with regard to that? I mean, I, I thought we, we were very, we had a, a gentleman's uh, wonderful discussion yesterday where you said you would give us proper notice, and I was just wondering uh, what should we expect in the future, that's all. Uh, as I, I said, that we will intend to give notice to all things. Uh, in this case, we only organized yesterday, uh, less than 24 hours ago. Uh, in the future, I would expect there would be greater notice, and I appreciate the gentleman's uh, the chairman question. Yield. Uh, the chairman at this, yield at this time, I am going to introduce the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Timothy. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose chairman does the gentleman seek recognition? Uh, an inquiry of the chair with respect to the procedure. The gentleman will state his parliamentary I've been in inquiry. I have been in the Congress for uh, uh, 14 years, and I have never, it is just unprecedented that a ranking member not be permitted to give an opening statement or for a chair to dispense with opening statements. So does the gentleman have to, a parliamentary so inquiry? Know, I, I asked, I didn't make a parliamentary inquiry. I'd ask then you. the gentleman is no longer recognized. The, uh, the, we will Mr. now Chairman, introduce, we will now introduce Chairman, on a point of order. Yes, the point of order. I, I certainly understand if the chairman has decided that he has nothing to say, but can you cite one example, any single example, in the history of the Congress, if you would, where a minority ranking member has not been given, been not been afforded, not been given the respect of an opportunity to make a, a brief opening statement? The chair will. will uh respond for the record with a, an appropriate list of the times in which opening statements have been waived or ranking members have not been able to. But you to. can't think of one right now. The gentleman is no longer recognized. We now turn to our witnesses. Mr. Timothy Massad is the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Treasur Treasury Department's Office of Financial Stability and Chief Troubled Asset Relief Program. 
Mr. Massad assumed the title of Assistant Secretary on September of 2010 after Herbert Allison stepped down from the position. Before that, Mr. Massad served as the Chief Counsel and Chief Reporting Officer for the Office of Financial Stability. Prior to starting his government work, he, was <clears throat> he worked at the Office of, uh, no, see, worked at the onset of the 2008 financial crisis. Mr. Massad was a partner at Kravath, Swan, and Moore, where he had a diverse international corporate practice with an emphasis on security offerings and bank financing, counseling, underwritings, and security issues. Mr. Massad received a AB degree magna cum laude from Harvard uh, College in 1978 and his JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1984. Mr. Neil Borowski, no stranger to this committee, was sworn in to the office on December 2008 as the Special Treasury Department Inspector General to oversee the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Prior to that, Mr. Borowski was a Federal Prosecutor in the United States Attorney Office for the Southern District of New York for more than eight years. In that office, Mr. Borowski was the senior trial counsel who headed the mortgage fraud group. Mr. Borowski also was, ex has extensive experience as a line prosecutor leading white-collar uh, prosecutions during his tenure as a member of the Securities and Commodities Fraud Unit. Mr. Borowski also led the investigation that resulted in the indictment of the top 50 leaders of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of, of, of Colombia, the FARC as it is better known, on narcotics charges. A case, <clears throat> a case described by then Attorney General as the largest narcotic indictment filed in U.S. history. Mr. Borowski received his B.A. from the Wharton School of Business and is a magna cum laude graduate, uh, graduate of the New York University of Law. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before testifying. Please rise, raise your right hand. Since it is my first time, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give, be, uh, give about, you are about to give this committee will be the truth and the whole truth? and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may please be seated. As is the customs of this committee, we would ask that your full written statements be placed in the record and that you limit your opening statements as close as possible to five minutes. As was the custom of my predecessor, you will, uh, you will see three lights. Green means continue to go. Yellow is the warning that you should not run through our intersection, and red in all 50 states means stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The normal rule of committee is that we go in, in order of, of rank. Uh, Mr. Massad, I believe uh, you would, by protocol, be first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, as it is commonly known. I am the Acting Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability at the Treasury, which means I am responsible for overseeing the program on a day-to-day -day basis. I recognize that TARP has not been popular. There is good reason for that. No one likes using taxpayer dollars to rescue financial institutions. Nonetheless, sitting here today, more than two years after a bipartisan Congress passed the legislation that created TARP, it is clear that the program has been remarkably effective by any objective measure. First and foremost, TARP helped prevent a catastrophic collapse of our financial system and our economy. In the fall of 2008, we were staring into the abyss. Lending by banks had practically stopped. Our credit markets had shut down, and countless financial institutions were under severe stress. This was a crisis not only for Wall Street, but also for Main Street. 
Simply put, we were at the risk of going into a second Great Depression. Today, people no longer fear that our major financial institutions or our financial system is going to fail. Banks are much better capitalized, and the weakest parts of our financial system no longer exist. The credit markets on which small businesses and consumers depend for auto loans, credit cards, student loans, and other financing have reopened. Businesses are able to raise capital, and mortgage rates are at historic lows. Of course, the economy is not yet fully recovered, and there is still much work to be done. Unemployment is unacceptably high, and the housing market remains weak. But the worst of the storm has passed. Second, we will not use all the money Congress made available for TARP, and we are exiting our investments and the private sector far faster than anyone thought possible. Let me briefly summarize a few key facts. Congress originally authorized $700 billion for this program. We will spend no more than $475 billion, and of the money spent to date, much of it has been repaid, approximately $270 billion. We still have about $166 billion invested in various institutions, and I am hopeful that we will recover much of that over the next two years, depending on market conditions. Finally, the ultimate cost of TARP will be far less than anyone expected. The total cost was initially projected to be approximately $350 billion. That number, however, has steadily declined over the past two years. According to the most recent estimates from both Treasury and the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the overall cost of TARP will be in the range of $25 to $50 billion. And the direct fiscal cost of TARP, as well as all the other interventions to address this crisis, is far less as a percentage of GDP than the cost of resolving the SNL crisis in the 1980s. In addition, the TARP cost will be primarily attributable to what we spend on our housing programs and our efforts to help responsible American families keep their homes. We expect that all the other TARP programs and investments, when considered as a whole, will result in very little or no cost to the American taxpayers and possibly a profit. In all of these efforts, TARP has been subjected to unprecedented oversight. When Congress created TARP, it also directed four different oversight bodies, including the Special Inspector General for TARP, Mr. Borofsky, who is sitting with me today, to carefully review all of our programs. In addition, TARP has been subject to vi vigorous congressional oversight by this committee and several others. We welcome this oversight, individually and collectively. It has helped us to develop, implement, and constantly improve our TARP programs. And we have strived to, strived to be transparent by providing a wealth of information about the program to the public. In particular, I am, look forward today to discussing Mr. Borofsky's most recent quarterly report. <clears throat> I am pleased that the report concludes that TARP helped, as he put it, head off a catastrophic financial collapse, and that the program's financial prospects are today far better, as he says, than anyone could have dared to hope just two years ago. The other oversight agencies have reached similar conclusions. The report also raises a number of concerns about the HAMP program and the so-called too-big-to-fail issue, and I'm happy to discuss those as well. Mr. Chairman, TARP succeeded in what it was designed to do. It helped stabilize the financial system and lay the foundation for economic recovery. It was not designed to solve all our problems, and we recognize that many Americans are still suffering. Nonetheless, thanks to a comprehensive strategy and decisive action, our economy is far stronger today than it was two years ago. Both political parties deserve credit for these achievements. Congress enacted the program at a time when the financial system was falling apart. In that moment, leaders from both parties stood up, stood together, and did what was best for this country. Thank you again for providing me the opportunity to testify here, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Mr. Borowski. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, it is a privilege and an honor to appear before you once again and to once again present to you our most recent quarterly report to Congress. This past quarter has marked the two-year anniversary of both TARP and SIGTARP. For SIGTARP, we have made great progress in striving to meet our goals of transparency, oversight, and enforcement. With this, our ninth quarterly report, along with 13 separate audits, they have helped shine a light on some of the darkest areas of the financial crisis and the government's response. 
They have also included important recommendations, which, when implemented and adopted, have resulted in, in great savings for the taxpayer and preventing waste, fraud and abuse. Our Investigations Division has been similarly busy. We have been able to secure civil or criminal fraud charges against 45 different individuals, 12 different companies and, to date, 13 criminal convictions. We have also been able to either recover or prevent from loss of fraud more than $700 million thereby assuring that SIGTARP as an agency will more than pay for itself. And with 142 ongoing criminal investigations, including those into executives at 64 different banks that either applied for or received TARP funds, we still have a lot more work to do. For Treasury and TARP, the results have been more mixed. While it is certainly good news, as, as Mr. Massad noted, that the decline, the, the estimates of TARP costs have declined and significantly, it is not the whole story. And too often, Treasury in its, its statements and in its testimony has too much of tunnel vision focused on the financial costs and the decline of those, obscuring the very significant and very real non-financial costs that will arise out of the Troubled Asset Relief Program. First, it ignores the very significant wholesale damage to government credibility that has arisen from Treasury's mismanagement of parts of the TAR program. Too often, these programs have been marked by loose compliance, failures in transparency and questionable decision making. And it is those very avoidable failures, as much as anything else that Treasury may point to, that account for some of the deep unpopularity of TARP. The second cost is perhaps the most significant of TARP's legacy, the continued existence and the moral hazard associated with institutions that are still deemed too big to fail. When Secretary Paulson in 2008 and then Secretary Geithner in 2009 spoke to the financial markets and assured that they would not let any of the, our largest financial institutions fail and would use TARP to backstop them, they did more than just reassure troubled markets. They sent a powerful message that these companies, these banks, would not be let to suffer the consequences of their own folly. And as a result, and notwithstanding the passage of Dodd-Frank last summer, these institutions still enjoy an advantage over their smaller rivals with enhanced credit ratings and cheaper access to credit and capital as a result of that implicit government guarantee. Indeed, in many ways, TARP has helped mix that same toxic cocktail of implicit guarantees and distorted markets that led to the disasters at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. TARP has also had mixed success in meeting the goals set for it by Congress, goals that were designed to address Main Street as well as Wall Street. And while I agree with Treasury that they have met the Wall Street goals, financial, they did help prevent a collapse of the financial markets, um, and that undoubtedly had a benefit not just for Wall Street but for Main Street, TARP has not met the goals set for it for Congress for Main Street. And perhaps the most significant and specific Main Street goal of preserving home ownership, its failures there have had some of the most devastating consequences. That effort, the Home Affordable Modification Program, has to date been a failure, with estimates that over the life of this program we are going to see probably well in excess of 10 million foreclosure filings on 10 million different families during the life of HAMP when compared with the Congressional Oversight Panel's recent estimate that no more than seven or 800,000 permanent sustained modifications, hope is slipping away. And Treasury's administration of this program gives little cause for optimism. They continue to refuse to adopt even the most basic metrics and goals and benchmarks to measure success. They appear to be afraid to rein in or impose penalties on the mortgage servicers who everyone can agree's performance on this program has been nothing short of abysmal. And as a result, we continue to see spiraling downward participation quarter after quarter after quarter. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, I, th I thank you for this opportunity and I do look forward to answering any questions you may have. I thank the gentleman and I thank him for his pinpoint accuracy of five minutes. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Massad, uh, you're, since you are here on behalf of Treasury as the person most knowledgeable, can you explain to us uh, the Secretary's statement on December 2010 on the subject of TARP and, and related bailouts, when he said, in the future, we may have to do exceptional things again if we fa face a shock that large? 
You just don't know what's systemic, I repeat, you just don't know what's systemic and what's not until you know the nature of the shock. Does that mean that the Secretary expects that if a housing crisis occurs again or some other shock, and we're not talking about an external force, but some other shock to the community, that we still have systemic risk, too big to fail, and the government will come in and, and bail out the large and allow the small to fail? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this, what the statement means, in my view, what I believe the Secretary was saying was that we cannot predict what the future issues will be in terms of risks to our system. And, but what, isn't that exactly and, what Dodd-Frank and all these other uh, legislation have done? We were supposed to eliminate too big to fail. Systemic risk was supposed to be managed by an analysis, if you will, a vetting of whether entities were robust enough now and in the future. Uh, and it is the reason that some companies were still around and some were folded. Isn't that true? Uh, you are correct, Mr. Chairman, that that is Dodd-Frank's purpose and that is what we are implementing. Dodd-Frank, after all, was passed six months ago and there is a lot of work to do to implement it. And it gives us the tools. Right, but the secretary, the secretary said this well after Dodd-Frank. For example, we have had B Bank of America here before us on, on multiple occasions. We have rolled Countrywide into B of A. We have rolled Merrill Lynch into B of A. I am not for breaking up companies or, or taking a heavy hand, but if Bank of America is too big to fail, then shouldn't we be insisting that they be and I am not suggesting this, but shouldn't we be suggesting that they find a way to not be too big to fail in whatever kind of, uh, of uh, divestitures they need, rather than putting them in that category, as the IG said, who enjoy less expensive cost of assets because, in fact, they are effectively backstaffed by the Federal Government? I think Dodd-Frank gives us the tools to regulate any financial institution regardless of its size, that poses systemic risks, and it gives us the, the tools to shut down such financial institutions. So I think it gives us precisely the tools you are talking about. If I can respond more broadly, uh, I think the concerns that Mr. Borofsky raised are obviously those that animated the Congress in passing Dodd-Frank. Those are the very issues that, that Congress debated in, in passing well, Dodd-Frank. Uh, as somebody who was on the conference for Dodd-Frank and somebody who has been there all along, uh, Dodd-Frank was not altogether that bipartisan, as you can imagine, and I appreciate the fact that it can shut down entities after the fact. It has a heavy hand to determine who is a financial entity. Perhaps the next time General Motors gets in, in trouble, we will shut them down as a financial entity rather than save them as somehow a bank. Uh, moving on to HAMP, as, uh, as the IG report says pretty thoroughly, we cannot score success by simply getting our money back from what, from what was essentially loans to solvent companies. We have to look at the money that we won't get back and the suffering of people who won't get a loan modification if they can't afford a home or an elegant exit that will not destroy the neighborhoods as we seek somebody who can't afford it. Uh, I have December 31, 2010 results, and I would like you to uh, comment on Mr. Borowski. Uh, the goal of HAMP, 3 to 4 million loans. Permanent modifications as of that date, roughly half a million, 521,000. Modifications canceled, almost 800,000. Would you please give me your view of HAMP uh, based on those figures and a trend that continues after multiple hearings? It is remarkably dispiriting. Um, and this was the program that was supposed to be to help Main Street. I mean, when TARP was originally enacted, when, when you, the Congress, gave Treasury the $700 billion, the original idea was that Treasury was going to buy toxic assets, which were largely mortgage-related assets. And the idea of including a goal of preserving home ownership in the statute was to address the fact that Treasury was going to own so many of these mortgages that they would be able to do these modifications themselves, being able to have that impact on Main Street. Instead, we have a program, and the numbers that you, you just indicated, um, it is just not working. Out of the $50 billion originally allocated, now about $45 billion, only a $1 billion has been spent. And I, I hesitate to use the word only and billion in the same sentence. But the numbers are, are, are it's, it's, we are running out of hope. Um, there is no way we are going to ever get close to the 3 to 4 million that was the original expectations of this program. But even more frustrating is that Treasury will not give us its expectations. They must know what their run rate is, of what they expect the, the total number to be. 
um, they must have a goal. And if they don't have a goal, well, they need to have one. We can't fix this program until we have very specific benchmarks as to what the program is trying to accomplish of keeping people in their homes, not people who get trial modifications that fail, which was one of the, 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 the benchmarks that have been used, not the number of people who get offers for trial modifications. How many people are going to get modifications that are truly permanent and keep them in their homes? I thank the gentleman. My time has expired. I recognize uh, a member of this panel who has a deep interest in those modifications becoming per, uh, permanent, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Messard and Mr. Borowski, the title of today's hearing is Bailouts and Foreclosure Crisis. On the first issue, we have some encouraging news today on TARP and its outlook for American taxpayers. SIGTARP report issued this morning has increasingly favorable assessment of TARP's financial successes. Um, is that right, Mr. Borowski? That is absolutely correct. And here is what uh, it says, and I quote, on the financial side, TARP's outlook has never been better. Not only did TARP funds uh, help head off a catastrophic financial collapse, but estimates of TARP's uh, ultimate direct financial cost to the taxpayer have fallen substantially, while Treasury's ultimate return on its investment depends on a host of variables that are largely unknowable at this time, TARP's financial prospects uh, are today far better than anyone could have dared hope just two years ago. And that is end of quote. This is great news for the American taxpayer, but the report correctly warns that there is still hard work ahead, and it is important that we continue strong oversight. I have long demanded stringent oversight of the TARP program, a program proposed by President Bush in 2008 and enacted after significant improvements by Congress. I previously requested. Uh, gentlemen, that SIGTARP audit the hundreds of millions of dollars AIG expended on bonuses. I also led 26 of my colleagues in requesting that SIGTARP audit the payments made to AIG's counterparties. That said, I am very concerned about the serious allegations of abuse by the mortgage service industry. Today's SIGTARP report calls their performance abysmal and describes nearly daily accounts of errors and more serious misconduct. The SIGTARP report also says this, and I quote, anecdotal evidence of their failures has been well chronicled, from the repeated loss of borrower paperwork, and I, my constituents tell me about that, to the blatant failure to follow program standards, to unnecessary delays that severely harm borrowers while benefiting servicers themselves, stories of servicer neg negligence and misconduct are legion, end of quote. Mr. Chairman, uh, we cannot do a comprehensive examination of the foreclosure crisis without hearing from the industry. That is why I sent a letter on December 21st asking you to hold the committee's first hearing on the widespread utilization of flawed and fraudulent practices throughout the mortgage industry. Uh, this, this has been my number one priority, as you said, and I assume that, that uh, we would move forward. It is the same reason I sent you another letter on, on Monday asking that you add uh, an industry witness. I understand that you uh, were not prepared to do that at this time, and I understand that. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, um, um, and to our witnesses, let me uh, go to you, Mr. Borofsky. The, the servicers, what are you all doing about them? I mean, I mean uh, government has a role. The servicers have, have roles. And I am just wondering what is happening with that. And I, uh, I ask you the same thing, Mr. Massad. Uh, well, we have, and, and be brief. Well, we have, you know, at SIGTARP, we, we exercise our jurisdiction as we can. And our one area of jurisdiction over the servicers is one, to investigate them if they do anything, if there is any criminal conduct. And uh, we do have ongoing investigations in that area. Um, the second thing we can do is use our audit function to do reviews of the servicers. And we have that ongoing as well. We are doing a review of, of the their performance under the net pre present value test and other aspects of their performance. Uh, what we cannot do is what Treasury can do, which is wield a, a big stick as well as the carrots that it offers those servicers and impose significant, tough financial penalties, because that is where it will hit them where it hurts. And we have to keep this program from being voluntary, not just in participation for the servicers, but in compliance as well. Well, that leads me right to you, Mr. Massad. What are we yeah. doing with regard to the servicers? Because sure. there have been some horrendous stories I, about I, what services have been doing. Uh, Congressman And Cummings, what impact do they have on these numbers? Congressman Cummings, I agree that the servicer performance has been abysmal, and that is something that uh, we have been trying to fix. Let me first make clear. This is a voluntary program. Congress didn't give us the tools to impose fines, as Mr. Borofsky is suggesting. What we have is the ability to withhold payment when they enter a permanent modification. 
A lot of the problem was we couldn't get them to get the permanent modifications done. So we worked with them to, to change their performance. Now, uh, there are a number of other things that are going on in terms of the performance of the servicers. There's an interagency task force that is looking at all the, all the things they've done wrong in foreclosures. And there's a lot of talk of having some sort of national servicing standards, which may well be something we need. We can't, through HAMP, change the entire industry's behavior. This is a, this is a model, this is an industry that's broken. It didn't work. It, well, can you, can you tell prepared. me this as my time runs out? Is the Justice Department involved in anything that you're doing? Yes, they are. They are involved in the interagency task force, as are all the, uh, the uh, Federal Bank regulators, and there is a lot of work being done on uh, what types of reforms are needed. There is also work being done by the FHFA in terms of changing the basic uh, economic structure of the business, because they simply weren't prepared for this crisis and uh, aren't able to deal with people. Uh, nevertheless, I think we have got to remember that um, HAMP has achieved over a half a million modifications. These are people that make $50,000 a year. So to sort of write it off and say, well, it's a failure, I think, uh, is not really appropriate. Now, the reason we haven't reached three to four million is basically we have eligibility standards. And the pool today of the people that are eligible is about 1.5 uh, million. What are those eligibility standards? We don't help people who make enough money that they don't need government help. We don't help people who have million-dollar mansions. We don't help people who have vacation homes. So when you go through that and you realize that's the eligible population, we've actually reached a lot of them. We're continuing to reach a lot of them. We had 1,000 people turn out for an event in Las Vegas. So while we've tried to incorporate most of Mr. Borofsky's suggestions about the program, other than perhaps the one that he said we should fingerprint people or thumbprint people before they get a mod, which we declined to do because, you know, we didn't feel that was appropriate. Uh, I think the program is actually helping a lot of people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. I thank the gentleman. The, gen the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here and, and thank you for addressing <clears throat> these really important issues that we have. You know, I, I think. You know, both of you get a sense of the anger, really, of the American people, but also of the sadness of, of the issues that we're dealing with. You know, when we look at and the New York Times yesterday uh, reported that the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission issued its report, and, and there's a quote in there that I think is important in the context of what we're dealing with today, and it says, the greatest tragedy would be to accept the refrain that no one could have seen this coming and that nothing could have been done. If we accept this notion, it will happen again. What is sad is that as we approach this and we look at what Treasury was doing as this crisis was unfolding, you know, these things were knowable. I mean, I, I know I and many other members of Congress were sounding the alarm of the mortgage foreclosure crisis, what was happening in our neighborhoods, what was happening in our communities, and, and understanding that capital had to be being lost as families were losing their economic future and, and, their, and their homes. And, and when you look at TARP and what is happening and how it is progressing, and, and I, I do really I, I can't understand how Treasury can, um, can claim its successes when it's had so many undefined um, executions. I voted against TARP. And I voted against TARP because, you know, I'm from Ohio, ground zero from the mortgage foreclosure crisis. And uh, when they came and said they were going to buy toxic assets and that these were going to have value, I, I knew they did not because I, I've walked these neighborhoods. I've talked to the families who have lost their homes. And, and the the, the short TARP bill would, was not defined, as, as you know, as you've said, um, Mr. Borofsky, and I greatly appreciate what that you not only look at what you're trying to unwind, but what they started with. This was a very undefined bill, the very undefined process, and I think there are billions that that have been lost. I'm very concerned about the HAMP program because, as if we look to what the Commission had said that this was avoidable, that means that families were taken advantage of, and that means families were taken advantage of and lost their financial future. And HAMP came forward as supposedly uh, a government answer that's going to help them, that's going to say we recognize that there was a federal issue here, and as the banks, all of the people who, due to their greed, uh, had, had perpetrated this, we were going to step in and help them. But, it, but it's not helping them. And, Mr. Broski, I want to thank you for the detail that you provide us. You know, I, when you get these final numbers and do the division, we're going to have spent an unbelievable amount for each of the loan modifications that occurred while doing nothing to stop the record foreclosures uh, that are, are still occurring. So, you know, first off, Mr. Borofsky, I think when we look at the ultimate numbers, we're going to want to figure out, 
you know, what percentage of these people who did ultimately get loan modifications could have gotten them in the market, so meaning that there was no subsidy that would have been needed. You know, two, how many of these are, are going to fail anyway, because those are lost dollars, dollars also. And then what are, what are the per unit costs in the end? Um, could you speak to that for a moment as to how we're going to be able to then actually assess what was spent? And, and, and the, we can always tell that it's a failure, and thank you for your words of that. But, but how are we going to assess the waste? Well, I think one of the, the good news aspects of, of, of the HAMP program, if, to the extent that there is good news, um, and it is reflected in, in CBO's uh, loss estimate, is that the program won't spend even close to the amount of money that is allocated for it. Money only gets spent when there is when there's actual success. So the remarkably low numbers of modifications means that a remarkably low amount, small amount of money will be spent. Um, and that is why we have only had, and I said I hesitate to use the word only, it is only been a billion dollars out of the 45 um, that is actually, actually been spent so far. So to the extent that there is good news, it is that it will not cost the taxpayer um, anywhere close to the allocated amounts. But of course, that distinction really bears that the, any type of claim of success for the remarkably modest numbers of, of modifications that are coming from the program you know, don't match up with what was originally intended. And the advantage of not having any real goals, real meaningful goals or benchmarks, is you can claim success wherever you want and say, hey, that's a success. And I do not mean in any way to demean or say that this program isn't very important to those people who are enjoying it and, and, and have the benefit of these important sustainable permanent modifications in any way. But I also think the idea that the reason why there aren't more is because there's millionaires living in mansions, and that's why there are a lot of people out there who are struggling very, very hard who could benefit from these, these modifications. Mr. Can Massett, I, I believe that, that um, the mortgage foreclosure crisis, when it's ultimately an analyzed, will, will turn out to be the largest theft in history. And it occurred while Treasury had oversight of both financial markets and the issues affecting these homeowners. And, and now we have TARP and Treasury is involved with this, and we have the SIG TARP looking at it and saying that you're still uh, managing this without measurable outcomes and are not being very forthcoming in, in how the program is being involved. How can, how can we trust what Treasury is doing in this? I am happy to respond to that, Congressman. First of all, Mr. Borofsky, if you could do so briefly. Sure. Uh, as Mr. Borofsky noted, we only pay money if there is a permanent modification entered into, if we actually help someone enter into a permanent modification, and we only pay for as long as that modification continues. There is a built-in taxpayer protection element to this. So your question about unit costs, a very good question, sir. And in fact, it is structured so that it is a unit cost uh, program here. We won't spend all the money if we don't enter into uh, enough modifications, and that money won't be spent for anything else. It will go back to pay down the debt. That is number one. Uh, number two, as we said, the eligibility criteria here, I think, are another way that we protect taxpayers, because we only pay, peop uh, pay for people that we think are, are greatly in need. As to your overall question here on the mortgage mortgage crisis. Obviously, there is a lot of study of this. The FCIC released its report today, um, and I think it, it noted that there is blame to go around in a, in a lot of places. I think we must remember TARP was just set up to provide the resources to stabilize the system. It didn't change the regulatory structure. We now have Dodd-Frank, which gives us new tools to uh, regulate the financial industry so as to prevent this type of uh, problem in the future. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. We, the Chair now recognizes the former Chairman of the Committee, longstanding member of the Committee, Mr. Towns of Brooklyn, New York. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me um, first thank both of you for being here. You know, I get the feeling that, you know, we sort of blaming each other. You know, and, 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 and that bothers me because people are losing their homes. I wish you could just come and spend one day in my office and just listen to people who are coming in and the stories that they are telling. I mean, some of the things they are saying is the fact that they made an application, uh, all of a sudden the application is lost, uh, they call and say, no, we never received your papers when they actually presented the papers. And then the other one, which is really one that they are saying that is really becoming a problem, is that when they call back the third or fourth time, the person no longer works here. So you need to find out who you are dealing with. And of course, if the person is not no longer there, how can you find anything? So, and I noticed you um, indicated, um, 
Mr. Massad, that you know the Congress didn't give you the power, and I understand that as well. But what can we do now to fix the situation that we're in? I mean, th this is a crisis, and I'm hoping that uh, I want to join you, um, a, a ranking member, uh, in asking for a foreclosure hearing where we can bring people in and let them tell their stories. Because I, for some reason, I don't think that the message is getting out in terms of the seriousness of this situation. Uh, Congressman, I agree with your concern. I, I uh, think you are absolutely right. We have tried to do what we can through HAMP to put in a lot of borrower protections. For example, we have required the servicers, if you are evaluating someone for HAMP, you can't uh, uh, foreclose on them. There is a number of other uh, protections we have put in. We put in call centers, escalation centers, and a lot of the calls we get actually are for people who aren't even eligible for HAMP, but we try to help them. I think in terms of the overall industry, a lot, of, a lot of attention needs to be paid to this, and I think a lot of work is going on and more will be needed, and I am sure this Congress will need to consider it. And a lot of people have talked about whether we should have national servicing standards. Uh, uh, people have noted that the, that the basic economic model of servicing doesn't work. Servicing works when uh, you have got performing mor mortgages. The, the institute, the, the servicers collect the payments and pass them on to the, to the investors. But when it comes to dealing with a crisis like this or foreclosures, they are not equipped to do it. So I think we have got to look at things like uh, uh, servicing standards. The interagency task force is looking at a number of problems. The regulators are as well. So I think there is a lot of activity here, uh, and uh, we will we'll see it in the, in the coming months. Mr. Borowski, what are the penalties that you talk about, and how can we sort of uh, look again at that, because something needs to be done. No, absolutely. And, and I think that, as, as Mr. Massett said, there's discussions about a, of, of national servicing standards. And I think that uh, Chairman Baer of the FDIC has put out some, some, some great ideas that would be terrific for, for all servicers. And I think that a lot of these ideas could be adopted and brought into the, the HAM program through, through supplemental directives. Uh, but financial penalties based on withholding payments to the servicers. Um, Treasury negotiated a deal when it, when it obligated about $30 billion to the mortgage servicers for payments. Um, and that includes the ability to, to withhold payment and impose financial penalties. Um, to the extent that those penalties are not strong enough or good enough, well, that really falls on Treasury for not negotiating a better deal. This is not the most unpredictable uh, possibility that when you have a program of this size and scope that there is going to be problems. Um, and Treasury has repeatedly cited the, their ability to impose financial penalties as, as something that, a, as a stick that they have. And we would just encourage them uh, to take the stick out. Can I, can I, if I can re reply to that, um, we are certainly uh, conscious of that, and we may withhold amounts in the future. But let's remember, we can only withhold the amount that we owe them for permanent modifications. If they haven't entered into very many permanent modifications, there's not that much to withhold. And there weren't very many permanent modifications initially. As this, as this committee knows, we, uh, people testified here in March and there were only 170,000 permanent modifications. And a lot of people said then the program was a failure. Uh, what we did since that time was we had a number of remedial actions we made the servicers take. We also diversified our programs, and I want to get into that later. But from that date, from last, late last March, we have increased the number of permanent modifications substantially now. And as I say, we are over 500,000, and the redefault rate on those is very, very low. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time is there. But I think that um, if there is something that we need to do, I think you need to say it. Because uh, we just can't continue to set people be, uh, lose their homes, and uh, I, when is it, I mean, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina and the subcommittee chairman of jurisdiction for this, Mr. Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in consultation with the chairman, uh, it's the intent of my subcommittee for us to have field hearings and hear from those that have been affected uh, from the HAMP program. Uh, we'd welcome the Treasury. Uh, uh, to invite individuals that, that have been helped. Uh, however, in my constituency and the constituents I have talked with, it is easier to find those that have been hurt by HAMP rather than helped. So my question to you, Mr. Massad, is do you have adequate provision under current law to ensure that HAMP is successful? Yes or no? Um, <clears throat> Congressman, it depends yes on... Yes or no? Congressman, if I can answer the question. I've got five minutes, Mr. Massad. Okay. Yes or no? Thank you. Actually, let me begin by asking, do you think HAMP is successful? I, I do. 
Okay. Uh, I think, so do you I believe think, under current provision of law you have adequate authority to ensure that HAMP I, is successful? I, I cannot solve the housing crisis with HAMP alone if that is the meaning of your question. But I think helping over 500,000 people enter into permanent modifications, people who would otherwise be thrown out of their homes, people who make $50,000, and their neighborhoods would be hurt by that because they are now living next to a home that could be vandalized, it depresses their property values, it is a drag on the economy. I think, yes, I think those Thank are you, dollars well spent. Thank you, Mr. Masai. Uh, uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, in your testimony, written testimony today, you outlined that uh, there are 2.9 million homes received foreclosure filings in 2010, up from 2.8 million in 2009 and 2.3 million in 2008. Uh, can you discuss your findings on the HAMP program? Well, yes. I mean, again, you, you can't, not to diminish the, the, the positive impact it had on the, has on those families and those that are able to stay in the program, um, but you have to look at what the program was expected to do, and you have to look at it in the context of the entire foreclosure crisis and what this program was intended to do. And the advantage of never actually putting out meaningful goals it means you can declare success even when you have looking at a total for this entire program of seven to 800000 when you originally expected to help 3 to 4 million, even when you have only spent $1 billion of the 45 that you allocated. Um, this program, it, it can help. If it helps five people, that is great for those five people. But what about all those millions of people who are not getting help, the millions of people that Treasury and the administration identified at the very beginning of this program of who they were going to try to help, help keep in their homes by, by modifying their mortgages to a sustainable level? Um, and the numbers don't lie. And when I hear them declaring success with these incredibly modest numbers, numbers that are so modest that, that they can't even have enough money to pay to impose financial penalties, um, it's heartbreaking to a certain extent because it means that they won't recognize and make the changes that are necessary to make this a better program. Because I hear from those people um, Thank you, Mr. Brown. as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and moving on to uh, the small business. Um, the uh, Small Business Lending Fund. Uh, it, well, in one of your in your report, you request that uh, Treasury mo remove TARP assets and equity from the entity's balance sheet for purposes of uh, evaluating its application uh, for the Small Business Lending Fund. The intent of the Small Business Lending Fund, of course, is to increase lending. Um, ha has Treasury uh, been open to your uh, proposal? Treasury has rejected that, that recommendation. Uh, Mr. Massad, why did you re reject that? Uh, because we wanted to make sure we complied with Congress's directives in the law. Congress, Congress provided in the law that existing TARP recipients could refinance their loans into this Small Business Lending Fund, and we believe we are acting in accordance with that. Sure, uh, but it doesn't give you, it is not a provision of law. Uh, how you measure uh, the removal from TARP into this small business lending fund. We, we did not believe that Congress instruct, was instructing us to um, uh, basically penalize those institutions that had ar already received TARP funds. Mr. Barofsky, In fact, quite the contrary. Mr. Borowski, under your reading of the law, do they have provision to do this? A absolutely. Uh, Congress specifically made a provision in the law that gave the, se the Secretary of Treasury the ability to fashion certain regulations for, for TARP banks to enter into SBLF. It's no there's nothing in the statute that gives you a matter of right by being a TARP recipient that you automatically get to apply for and, and, and we well, get to apply for it, but that you automatically get converted into SBLF. I mean, SBLF offers tremendous advantages to, the, to, to TARP recipients who convert, and the taxpayer loses out on a lot of those. And our recommendation is a simple one. Let's make sure that the banks that, that you take and out of TARP and put into SBLF are adequately capitalized to meet the goals of this program. We are not saying penalize TARP banks and say they can't, none of them can get, can get brought into the program, not at all. But we do think that it is important for Treasury to be very responsible and make sure that those that are going to get the benefits of being an SBLF at taxpayer expense are well suited to be able to do the lending new lending, new incentivized lending from government capital, and frankly, we believe that those banks should be treated as other applicants who come into the program. When a bank applied, for example, when a bank applied for the CPP, they didn't get to take into account government capital of whether they, were, they passed or don't pass, and that should be the same standard here. The fact that these banks have the benefit of government capital 
frankly, we don't believe that that necessarily um, that that capital should count when making that evaluation. And if they are adequately capitalized without the government capital and they can fulfill the goals of this program, great, they should be brought into the program if they meet the other conditions. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I know my time has expired, but I would ask Mr. Yes. Assad to respond in writing uh, to this very subject. Uh, we, we were interested here in this committee, and if you have concern that you don't have adequate the gentleman agrees law, to respond. we would like to change that. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Thank you. First, I would like to uh, thank the panelists for their public service and uh, report some good news in that the Dow just uh, crossed 12,000 for the first time since uh, June of 2008. And that shows uh, capital is flowing again and is a very good sign of economic recovery in our great country. And from your testimony today, uh, TARP played a role in moving us in, in this good direction. Uh, you pointed out that it uh, not only averted a, a meltdown, uh, but laid the groundwork uh, for economic recovery, which we are, which we are seeing today. I, I must say that during the dark days, I was getting phone calls in the middle of the night and all day long from constituents who were afraid of a collapse. There was a run on the money market on some banks. And I personally believe that my vote in support of TARP will historically be regarded as the right thing to do and good public policy. Although all of us who were on the campaign trail, many of us were attacked uh, relentlessly for having uh, supported uh, this important program. I would like uh, permission to put in the record one of the best uh, reports that I have seen on, on the su success. It is bipartisan uh, from uh, Blinder, a Democratic economist, and Zandi, a Republican one, on how the Great Recession was brought to an end. Without and, objection, so ordered. And, and also an article in The American Banker, uh, which talks about the home, home foreclosures and a foundation that is working with HAMP and others to help people stay in their homes. So ordered. I, I um, specifically would like to uh, respond to the two problems that Mr. Boreski uh, mentioned in his testimony. First, the cost of TARP in terms of confidence in our government, transparency and other management uh, mistakes. And I would like to mention that I authored a bill in response to your first criticisms on this that would have computerized uh, TARP in real time so we would know where the finances are. It passed the House, backed by the Chamber of Commerce and Labor, one of the few bills. And I, I truly believe we should do it for the entire financial system. If we can track where our package is in two seconds, we should be able to track uh, where we are in our exposure uh, in, in finances. I feel it is an important bill and one that we need to work on and revamp to the current status. Uh, you also mentioned the too big to fail and uh, the fact that your, your concerns that we may not have done enough. So I would like uh, Mr. Massad to response, respond to this specifically in the Dodd-Frank uh, bill, and I was likewise on the conference com committee with the chairman, we created a Financial Stability Oversight Council to monitor the systemic risk and to set criteria to identify institutions that may uh, be heightened risk. I would like you to comment on the status of where that is. We also very importantly established an orderly wind down, similar to what we have in the FDIC, which was a huge success. We had two choices. We could either bail out an institution or let them fail. Neither was a good solution. We want to be able to wind them down as we were able to do with FDIC uh, banks so successfully. Uh, and I want to know, are the rules in shape and where does that stand? Uh, thirdly, we, we imposed capital requirements and leverage ratios. Uh, to ensure that large institutions aren't taking excessive risk. I believe those rules are coming out in July. Correct me if I'm wrong. And where does that stand? Where, where do you think the leverage and capital requirements will come out in your best uh, uh, judgment? And lastly, we, we called upon the SEC to come up, and we gave them actually new powers and authority uh, and resources. Uh, to go after uh, bad actors so that we could find the next uh, Bernie Madoff and, and, and help protect our system. So I would like you to respond to where these initiatives stand. What do you recommend, if anything else, we need to do to protect us from too big to fail, as was pointed out in his testimony? And if you have enough time, could you respond to TARP as it relates to the taxpayer? We know it was a great deal for our economy. It was a great deal for averting uh, 
economic risk. I am the daughter of two parents who suffered in the Depression. Their stories uh, were terrible. We averted that in our economy. Um, but was it a good deal for the taxpayer? Thank uh, you very much for your service. Certainly, certainly Congresswoman. I would be happy to respond to all those things. Let me start perhaps with the last point. I, I appreciate that people that are still suffering from this crisis, and there are many, uh, may not feel that TARP w did anything for them. And, and Mr. Borofsky also has asked, what did it do for Main Street? I think the study you pointed out, the Zandi study, um, makes it I'd ask clear. unanimous consent for an additional one minute for the witness to respond. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It makes it very clear. We would have entered into a, a second Great Depression. We could have faced unemployment, in their estimate, above 16 percent. Other people have said 25 percent. The fact that we averted that is a real benefit to Main Street. The fact that people can now uh, borrow again when they couldn't as a result of this crisis is a benefit to Main Street. The fact that we have an auto industry in this country and we saved a million jobs, not just at the auto companies but at their suppliers, is a benefit to Main Street. So there are a number of benefits to Main Street. I don't think one has to look very far to realize that. As to the progress in implementing Dodd-Frank, a lot of work is going on. I am not responsible for that, but I am happy to tell you what I know and to make sure that the proper officials uh, of Treasury give you additional information. But the Financial Stability Oversight Council has been meeting uh, actively and developing a number of rulemakings to address these issues. And they have you know, the, the powers to regulate systemic risk and to look at what are the emerging trends in our, in, in our financial system that need to be addressed? So I think you will see a lot of work going on there. As to capital ratios, they are working on that also. Those will be higher. They are already higher. In other words, our financial system today is much better capitalized than it was in the fall of 2008. And many of the institutions are, are much better capitalized than their foreign competitors. The other thing I want to note is If you could just summarize just, briefly, please. Certainly. On small banks, we funded over 400 small banks under TARP, and that is another benefit to Main Street, because those banks help local communities, small businesses, and families. And as to uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman McHenry's point on the SBLF, obviously Treasury supported this new fund. And I think the only issue is a minor one that Mr. Borofsky is raising, because actually we do make, Treasury does make a new credit decision on whether a TARP recipient is eligible. If a TARP recipient hasn't paid its dividends, it's not allowed to get uh, the new to, to refinance. So there is a new credit decision made. He's just ra raising a particular point which we felt the statute did not allow us uh, to, to do. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for thank five you, minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the gentleman for uh, being with us uh, today. And Mr. Borofsky, you and your staff in particular for the um, for the integrity and professionalism that you you bring to your uh, your job, we we certainly appreciate that. Your your comments earlier were that the HAMP and the making home affordable programs were remarkably the, the, their their performance remarkably dispiriting. In today's journal, there's a quote that the foreclosure efforts at Treasury has been beset by problems from the outset, and despite frequent retooling, continues to fail dramatically, or excuse me, fall dramatically short of any meaningful standard of success. The, the, the article goes on to mention about the FHA short refinance program, which started last fall and has helped 15 people. So I guess my question is, at what point do we say, hey, this just, is, this just isn't working, this just isn't getting the job done? Would we be better off just discontinuing the whole program um, after three years, three to four million goal? Uh, a few hundred thousand have actually been permanently uh, in, in permanent modification have had help. Treasury talks about now the metric they are using is offering people help versus actually providing it. At what point do we say, hey, this is, uh, this is just not working, let us let's end this program? I, I continue to be a, a glass half full type of person. Um, well, based on your comments, though, Mr. Borofsky, it, 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 you wouldn't be a glass half full, you would be a glass 2 percent full well, or 1 percent full. Uh, and that, so, I mean, I am an optimistic true. guy, too. We live in America, but that is that's really stretching it. Well, I, I think that hope is slipping away. And I think that if, if Treasury doesn't respond to some of these things in a quick manner, um, you know, your suggestion of ending the program and other suggestions is just going to become a louder and louder chorus, and, and understandably so. And I think the way for Treasury to respond to that 
is not to keep clinging for these, these non-credible declarations of success mm -hmm. and be straightforward and honest and say, this is where we think this program will be at the end of 2012 or at the end of 2017 when the program is done. This is the number of people that we, we intend to have sustainable permanent modifications. This is how we are going to get to that number. Then you and this committee and the Congress and the American people can make the evaluation. Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Is it worth it to continue? Well, I think if they fail to do so, you are you're, you're probably you, dead on right. Yeah, you got you got more patience than I have. And in fact, yesterday I, I introduced with, the, with also the co-sponsorship of the chairman and the ranking member on the committee, uh, Congressman McHenry, we introduced legislation in, in the HAMP program. We just doesn't think it, we just think any objective look at this, it doesn't warrant continued um, spending of taxpayer dollars. Now, I want to be clear on, on a couple things. You're, you have jurisdiction over the $45 billion in the TARP program that affects the, the foreclosure uh, programs, HAMP in being the biggest one. But there is also $25 billion that's, that's available to Treasury in the Housing and Economic Devel uh, Development uh, or, excuse me, Recovery Act. Is, is that accurate? That money is money that goes to Fannie and Freddie. Okay. But so is any of that money, to, and I understand it is not your jurisdiction, to, to, to the extent you know, has any of that money been applied to or used in any way for uh, foreclosure prevention type programs at Treasury? <laughs> yes. And, in and our if so, are the results similar to what we have seen in HAMP? Well, actually, yes. When we are talking about HAMP, we are really talking about both components, okay. the, the GSC money, which is not funded through the taxpayers, and, right. then, and then the TARP. And frankly, to date, the GSC part of the program is doing better than the TARP part of the program. Of this 520,000 uh, approximately or 540,000 of, of ongoing permanent modifications, more than half of those are attributable to Fannie and Freddie and the GSC. It is only about 220,000, 230,000 modifications that are actually TARP permanent modifications. Um, so there is activity over there. And we detail in our report, we break all these numbers down from mm -hmm. GSC versus non-GSC, uh, including how much money the GSEs have reported that they have spent on, on these modifications providing to servicers. So, but, but the bottom line is there is approximately $70 billion that has been appropriated for this type of program, the HAMP program. $70 billion, not $45, $70 billion, and $1 billion is all that out, went out the door for a, a program that has hurt people it is supposed to help. And, and, is, and in your def definition, a remarkably dispiriting program, what I would call a colossal failure. Is that accurate? Yes. And as I, as I said, I, I certainly understand your frustration, and I share your frustration. I just hope that Treasury can hear what you are saying and hear, hear these legislative intent and, and, and come up and be honest about where this program is going, uh, if it is going anywhere. And let me just finish this. I got 15 seconds. And to put it all in context, $70 billion appropriated for this at a time, not, not helping the people it is designed to help total failure. The guy who is charged with inspecting it understands total failure at a time we have a $14 trillion national debt running debt. I mean, at some point we have got to say enough is enough. Let us end this program. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now yields to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Mr. Massad, isn't it true that HAMP's performance is uh, dependent upon the voluntary willingness of mortgage servicers to give distressed borrowers loan modifications? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, <coughs> isn't it true that private mortgage servicers have found creative ways to frustrate attempts by distressed borrowers to uh, save their homes? There has certainly have been problems with, with mortgage servicers. Is that a yes servicers. or no? Um, I don't know if it has been creative, but it certainly has happened. Uh, since it is readily apparent that the party really responsible for HAMP's performance is a private industry that won't give consumers a fair shake, uh, I can't understand why we don't have a representative from the uh, servicing industry to explain uh, that industry today. Uh, the minority requested that J.P. Morgan Chase, a major servicer, appear today, uh, but the chairman refused. And I don't know how we can have effective oversight um, or, uh, for Congress or the American public, how they can really understand the Federal response to the foreclosure uh, crisis, which depends on the private sector, without asking the private industry to explain their actions that are impeding this program. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, if the chair will uh, uh, let me have my time uh, afterwards, I'll. Of course, the uh, the chair made a de decision that today would be fully involved with the government side and the special IG's report. We do intend on having, among others, servicers and a review of the HAMP program. This is but the first of our discovery, and I appreciate the gentleman's uh, comments and yield uh, back, and we will uh, add 20 seconds. I appreciate that. Now, um, SIGTARP's um, 
report and other reports of abuses by loan services, Mr. Chairman, raises serious concerns that these mortgage providers may be engaged in a pattern of abuse. And, uh, Mr. Borofsky, I would like to request that your office conduct a specific audit on this issue. And I would like to, at this point, ask the Chair if you would join with me in this request, since you are saying that you are willing to go forward uh, with uh, looking at the mortgage servicers. I will certainly consider it. Uh, would you give me the request in writing? I uh, will do that, because what I want to point out, thank you, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, while, while the Chair certainly has the unilateral privilege to issue subpoenas, uh, the Chair also has the privilege not to uh, call certain witnesses. It is comforting to know that you will consider calling witnesses in the mortgage service industry, especially since it is so relevant to the matter at hand. Uh, the Chair also, as we know, has the privilege to deny documents, uh, uh, to the production of documents to other members. And, uh, for example, in this case, I am not saying this happened, but my concern would be about that policy is that if, JP, if there was any communication with the committee and J.P. Morgan Chase that, you know, the minority may not know about it. And uh, I am um, also concerned that if, uh, uh, in this matter of J.P. Morgan Chase servicers not appearing today, uh, perhaps uh, uh, I myself certainly wanted to address that in my opening uh, statement. I didn't have that privilege, nor did our ranking member. That is one of the problems. In, not having opening statements. So I, I, I hope that as we uh, continue down the road in this committee, we will understand the importance of, uh, of uh, tradition and procedure uh, that uh, respects the rights of all members, because I think what it really does is it enables us to function more effectively. Now, Mr. Uh, Massad, what is Treasury doing to retool HAMP to require improved uh, servicer performance, and do you need legislative authority to implement an effective retooling? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. It's a very important question. Let me talk about some of the things we have done. We've uh, required the servicers uh, to, if they're evaluating someone for HAMP, they cannot foreclose on that person. And if they decide that the person isn't eligible for HAMP, they must still consider other alternatives, short sales, proprietary modifications, and so forth. And it's only after they certify that they've done all those things that you can proceed to a foreclosure. We've required the servicers to have uh, to have a process for uh, appealing the decision. We have also set up our own uh, centers so that people can come to us if they feel they have been wrongly denied, and we will run a calculation to see if uh, to, to give them a view on that. And we have an escalation center that, uh, that deals with complaints. So, and you, well, let me ask you this. Would you agree that we will never get to the bottom of this problem or figure out how to proactively deal with the foreclosure crisis if we don't examine the actions of mortgage servicers uh, who alone make the decision? about who may keep or must leave his or her home? Uh, I, I would agree, Congressman, that, that we need to look at how this entire industry is functioning or rather not functioning. And I and, think and there is a lot of work going on in that regard. And obviously through HAMP, which is, is as you have noted, a voluntary program, we cannot uh, uh, force a change on the entire industry. Uh, but we have learned a lot, we think, about, but, but about what Barofsky is But Mr. Borofsky can examine it. Yes, 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 Congressman. And, and by the way, we do have an ongoing audit of the mortgage servicers, and I will make sure that my, my staff meets with your staff to see if there is any specific concerns that we should incorporate into that review. I think, think it is awesome when you communicate with the Chair on that as well. Uh, how, is, that, uh, is my time expiring, or do I have 20 seconds more? Yes, 20 yes. Okay. The gentleman has 20 additional seconds. Uh, th th thank you. And th this is so important to my constituency, because Cleveland, Ohio has been uh, an epicenter of the subprime meltdown. People have lost everything they ever worked a lifetime uh, uh, for. And when you get in a situation where they depend on HAMP to try to save their, uh, their homes and the mortgage servicers try to have a, have a subterfuge to defeat that, it is important we call them to an accounting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is most welcome. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Pardon. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank uh, both of the uh, witnesses for being here today. And uh, recognizing that um, we are in difficult times, uh, there are lots of, um, I, I'm sure it's not, e let me just say, I'm sure it's not e easy to sit there and, uh, and take the questions, but there is a lot of frustration. And, um, you know, I just, I, I wanted to start off by, by saying this, that my observation so far is uh, that what we are talking about is failed government regulations and programs. Uh, and today what we are talking about is, or some people are talking about, is what other government programs can we add on top of that to try to make the failed ones work, as if, though, 
more government regulation, more government programs is going to be the answer. And I'll tell you, and I've heard a, a couple people from Ohio talk about Ohio being the epicenter of foreclosures. Uh, I would welcome them to come down to Fort Myers, Florida, uh, to Lehigh, to Cape Coral. Uh, and I'll tell you what my constituents are telling me. They're telling me, stop. We don't want more of this government kind of control. We don't want, we don't want the idea that government is going to solve all of the problems when a lot of people feel like government is part of the problem. So if you think about what's happened, government started to push people and, and mortgage companies into making loans and putting people into homes uh, that, that maybe weren't uh, fiscally able to do that, either the company or the individual. Then when we have a, uh, a crisis, we then turn to more government in regulating. And what you get is, Instead of banks being able to lend, if you talk to community banks, they're afraid to lend because exactly what um, uh, Mr. Uh, Massad, did I say that right? Yes, you did. Uh, just be, you got to think about what you said earlier. You said that we need to incorporate some national standards. When these, when these lenders hear that, what they hear is more punishment. What they hear is... Uh, more changes are coming. We don't know what the, what the ground rules are. We're afraid to, to lend. When you bail out the big banks, it disadvantages the small banks. So when you talk about the costs of TARP or, or these other bailout programs, uh, what you're missing is the cost of potential from other sectors. So you've got the big banks that you want to claim have, you know, done so well. I don't know that I see it that way, but it's been at the, at the cost of the small banks. And now what we're seeing is lenders do not want to lend because they're afraid of statements like, now we need national standards. So again, what I'm saying is, is stop. What I want to hear is, not what's the next regulation, what's the next program, what's the ne next acronym that we're going to start talking about that is a failure because government can't do it. I want to I hear from both of you, if you would, very specifically, what should we repeal? What kind of repeals can we do that will help ignite uh, borrowing and lending uh, that is going to help small businesses or that are going to help families who are trying to uh, put their lives back together, instead of talking about what new programs we're going to pass, I'd like if both of you and, and uh, uh, Mr. Massad, uh, I'll start with you, if you could tell me, what do you think we ought to repeal? Thank you, Congressman. I'm happy to do that. Um, first of all, my responsibility is the TARP program. I'm not a regulator. But what I would say is this. I'm trying to get the government out of the business of owning stakes in private companies and, you know, telling private companies what to do. Excuse That's me why. real quick, but when you say now we need national standards, yes. think about what you said and think about what people back home, think about those small banks, think about the people who are trying to, you know, make it every day. What they've just heard is the rules of the game are going to change again and now you are saying we need national standards. Um, I was referring to national servicing standards for the, the servicing of mortgages, which we already have some. And, uh, you know, this, this business is mostly dominated by the big banks. The, the small banks aren't really in it. The big banks represent well, yeah, the vast. Because they can't compete because government has sided with one over the other. Well, um, I, I think the, the and point. Again, if you come down to southwest Florida, the community banks are so important mm -hmm. to, I, I, to housing. But they've been pushed out because government has come in and bailed out the big banks. They can't compete. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, Congressman, I agree small banks are very important. That's why we funded so many of them under TARP. Again, that was something we, we had to do. I don't think it was a good thing for the government to have to have done that, but we, but we had to do it, and that's why we're trying to get out of it so quickly. Um, but in terms of, you know, your comment on failed government programs, 
I think all we are trying to do is say we still are in the midst of a very terrible housing crisis that is a drag on our economic recovery. And Let the me, servicers uh, If I could, I am sorry. The gentleman's time, time has expired. time has expired. If, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask I would ask unanimous consent for one additional minute. If, so and, and I will just say this to the Chairman. Uh, if you would uh, submit to this committee uh, for us, please, in writing, specific things that we can repeal that is going to help, instead of submitting to this committee what, you, what other regulations and programs that we ought to uh, be performing, I would like to hear what you think we ought to repeal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the gentleman would yield his remaining time. Yes. Uh, as long as we are doing ask, Mr. Massad. Would you commit before the next quarterly special IG report comes out either to produce a revised estimate of how many loan modifications you expect HAMP to produce, along with the source material made available to the special IG, or in the alternative, make available to Mr. Borowski the source material so he can bring us an assessment? Uh, yes, sir. I would be happy to do that. We have been working on that, and uh, I think a lot of that data is out there, but, but we are happy to We do sure that. appreciate it. I know the committee would appreciate that. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, Mr. Massad, thank you both for your, your great work, and uh, uh, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, I am more familiar with your work, so uh, uh, especially so, sir, uh, the work that you have been doing. I, I do want to take just a uh, maybe a half a minute to, to really correct some of the revisionist uh, history here on, on TARP. Uh, I voted against TARP. And when it came before the Financial Services Committee and before this Congress, uh, the stated legislative goal of TARP was to help Main Street, to help Main Street, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Uh, and when we asked Secretary Paulson at the time, just before the vote, we said, uh, actually, I think it was the ranking member on financial services said, why don't you just take money and stuff it into the banks, the $700 billion that you wanted? And Mr. Paulson said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We looked at that, and that won't work. Then 10 days after this bill passed, TARP back, passed, they did exactly that. They injected all that money into the banks. This was the bank shareholder relief program. And for people now to say, yeah, this is exactly what we voted for. This is not what we voted for. We voted to, to increase lending. That was the goal of, of the Congress when TARP was put on the floor. And many of us saw the failings of that. And uh, to, to now say, oh, yeah, we, we supported TARP for all the right reasons, uh, I think you have to accept the fact that uh, TARP stuffed basically $700 billion worth of taxpayer money into big banks helping out these uh, shareholders. Uh, we paid 100 cents on a dollar to Goldman Sachs because we pumped $14 billion into AIG. It was a pass-through. It went right to Goldman Sachs. 100 cents on a dollar on, on credit default swaps that shouldn't have been worth uh, half that. Uh, we also passed through hundreds of millions of dollars to AIGFP employees who mispriced this risk as part of TARP. They got paid off. They got bonuses from taxpayer money. How you can take credit for that and say that that was a good thing? And it was a, never a question of, I know people said, well, if we did nothing, well, we wouldn't have done nothing. We would have done something different. And I just think there are a lot of weaknesses in this TARP uh, program. I think, Mr. Borofsky, you've, you've dug down, drilled down and got to many of them. But I want, to, I want to take my last couple of minutes to talk about the servicing industry, because so much of the servicing industry is, is mentioned in this report, and I think it's, it's spot on. Uh, I want to just talk about, I'll just list all the investigations that are going on right now with the services. And we're not, we're not going after them in a meaningful way. I don't think Treasury is. On October 13, 2010, the Attorney General of all 50 states announced a joint investigation into whether some of the nation's largest financial institutions are using flawed and forged documents to execute uh, wrongful foreclosures. The Federal Reserve and the, Federal Re uh, the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency are now investigating whether systemic weaknesses in the industry are leading to improper foreclosures. On January 7, 2011, the Supreme Judicial Court in my own home state of Massachusetts voided home seizures because 
uh, the folks who were foreclosing couldn't actually prove they owned the mortgages. The United States Trustee Program has a similar program. Uh, the attorneys generals of Arizona and Nevada doing the same thing. The Justice Department. What are we doing about the services? How are we, how are we going to uh, clean up this industry and correct these problems if we're not going right after the services? That seems to be uh, where the problem lies. I'm, I'm happy to respond to that, Congressman. Please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You, you've referred to the activity that is going on by uh, a variety of federal agencies, and it's under the auspices of an interagency task force that Treasury co-chairs. So that is uh, very important work, uh, and I think we will see some results of those uh, investigations, and I think it will uh, help us uh, figure out what types of reforms are needed, and I'm, uh, potentially some of those things will be coming before the Congress. Let me just also, though, respond. Uh, I appreciate the fact that because this program was first announced as a means to purchase troubled assets and then it became a program where at least initially what, the, uh, what Secretary Paulson did under the Bush administration was to in invest money in banks, uh, people, uh, people were uh, critical of that. And uh, all I would say to that is a couple of things. One, I think under the circumstances, we had to make that change. There wasn't time to do the troubled asset purchase uh, as it was originally contemplated. Number two, we didn't do $700 billion. We actually spent far less than that. Uh, and we $534 billion. Uh, we so much of the $534 billion. If you want to, you know, if you want an exact number that two, went directly to the banks, no, two, two still a lot of money. Congressman, if I may. You would summarize your answer, please. Sure. Uh, about, about $250 billion went to banks, and most of that has been recovered, and we will make a profit on those investments. Thank you, gentlemen. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brofsky, Mr. Massad, thank you for being here today. Uh, Mr. Massad, in your opening comments, you, you made a reference to the automobile industry, of which I am a part of. I am a, I'm a uh, car dealer and a small business person. So while people talk about small business and, and their view of it from 40,000 feet, I am actually on the ground. I can tell you this. The small business loan fund is not working. And most banks cannot operate out of fear. The regulations that have been imposed on these people makes it impossible to get access to these funds. Now, why do I say that? Because I go through it every day, not only myself, but the people that I'm in business with. And while I'm an elected official today, in my real life, I'm a small business owner. I can tell you, with somebody that has all the skin in the game every day, I would suggest to you that while we go on with these programs and we live in this wonderful world of acronyms that really makes sense inside this beltway, in real America it makes absolutely no sense to anybody, and these loans simply are not available. So while we talk about this money that's available to help us survive, the reality of it is that it is not available to us. Now, what's changed? It's the rules. To me, too big to fail means that I'm too small to survive. Most of the banks that I do business with are small banks. They are absolutely frozen with fear. The regulations and the rules have put them in a situation that they cannot operate with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Quarterly, the covenants change for me. And as we talk about small business leading the way out of this economic mess we're in, I will tell you, it is the uncertainty that all of us face. And I'm not talking about big corporations. I am talking about Main Street America. I am talking about the average person the guy that gets up every day and worries about it, not just during business hours, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day. My only question to you, sir, is, and I don't know what you can do about it, but there has to be some way that we can free up these funds to make it possible for these people to survive. The people have lost faith in this system. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman, that's uh, a very good question, and you raise a lot of important points. Um, let me say a couple of things. One is that, uh, what we tried to do under TARP was in part restart the, uh, the credit markets that help small business, the securitization markets on which a lot of them actually depend for loans. And I think we have succeeded there. There is still a lot of work to do to help small business. I agree with you 100 percent. Small business has been uh, hurt in this crisis. Small banks have been hurt in this crisis, and, and they haven't fully recovered. The, uh, the small business legislation that was passed last year, which set up not only the Small Business Lending Fund, but also another program where the states are trying to help small businesses directly, I think goes, you know, provides some help. It may not be enough. 
So I am happy to explore with you uh, further things uh, that should be done in that regard, uh, because I agree it is it's, uh, it's a problem that needs attention, uh, and I think the Treasury and the Obama administration have tried to, uh, to pay attention to that. And I, and I appreciate your comments, but I would tell you this, time is of the essence, and we really do not have. We are that close to the ground right now. There is not a lot of free fall left. So I appreciate you so much for being there, and I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. And the Chair appreciates that. The Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a predicate to my question, I want to note a, um, an article from the Abilene Reporter News uh, describing what appears to be the Republican approach to uh, the uh, meltdown of homes. Uh, and I ask unanimously consent that this be place into the record. Without objection. Uh, 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 Mr. Neugebauer is the um, chairman of the Financial Services Committee. He is a, a, a former banker himself, and he is pretty frank. He, he essentially says that the initiatives aimed at cushioning the blow and, uh, and um, have all failed. And so he says, let the market take over. Uh, to quote him, markets aren't kind, but they are very efficient. Should we go cold turkey and leave millions of uh, homeowners out there to suffer the consequences? And I like a short answer because I have further questions. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Massad and Mr. Borowski, who seems to just throw up his hands often. Yes, Mr. Massad. Um, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think we should just go cold turkey. That is why I, I would disagree with some of the comments that have been made that because HAMP has not achieved 3 to 4 million uh, modifications, that, that therefore we should end it. I don't think that makes sense. Uh, I think this program uh, can still uh, help a lot of people. I think it is constructed so that we only use uh, taxpayer funds prudently and wisely to the extent that we do help people. I think it is helping the right people, people who, well, let, who let me, need. Let me go to Mr. Bobrovsky then. I think it is incredibly important. You know, TARP was designed in part just as much to help the Wall Street banks as to help struggling homeowners. That was part of the intent of the legislation. Um, and I think Treasury bears a, 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 an important responsibility to fulfill that goal that Congress set forth of So you don't think ownership. we should go cold turkey and just leave, leave millions of, of borrowers out there? Uh, I would like to see the to program. Let the market, uh, to let the market do, do what the market always does. It does resolve all such crises, one way or the other. I would like to see a, a credible revamp of HAMP so that it can achieve the goals that were written. Okay, let's talk for. about that. Because I am essentially remedy oriented. Uh, and uh, I, as I have seen in my own district uh, how HAMP has failed so many homeowners, people who work hard for their homes, got caught up in a crisis uh, not of their making, it does seem that the only way out of this is to uh, take measures that uh, protect both homeowners and uh, investors. A recent Washington Post article January 18th, as a matter of fact, suggested that the incentive structure for services is greatly uh, um, misaligned. Let me just quote that. Studies have shown that foreclosure is often more profitable for a company known as a mortgage a servicer that collects the monthly payments on mortgages and passes them on to investors who own the mortgages. However, it is often not the best path for borrowers who lose their home or investors or investors who lose money. Uh, Mr. Massad, is it true that mortgage servicers often have a financial incentive to foreclose on distressed borrowers uh, and at times that, that the, the program, your program, actually gives them a financial disincentive to work with borrowers? And what are you doing about it? Well, what we're, what we're trying to do is give them an incentive to, to keep people in their homes. And I think the, the structure of the program uh, has worked in that regard. And, and that's why also it has been emulated by the industry. You know, before this program was started, we had two years of this crisis. Well, Nothing well, why, was done. Why is, why, is, why is FHF 
a considering an entirely uh, I new think compensation structure if this one is uh, no, so fine let, and dandy? Yeah, no, no. Let me let me make sure I'm clear. I agree with what the FHFA is doing, and and Treasury has supported that. They are looking at the basic business model of the servicers because it doesn't work. It is broken. It doesn't create the right incentives. HAMP was also trying to change those incentives with respect to the loans we could affect. And that is, as I have said, a, a limited pool. It is not the entire industry. But one thing that, that has Do also you think the FHA uh, measures would, will have a meaningful impact? Well, um, I, I certainly hope so, Congresswoman. What they are doing is saying, look, we need to reexamine how servicers are compensated, because what has happened is they are overcompensated for loans that are performing, but when it comes to, to the underperforming loans, they are not set up to, to deal with people, to uh, resolve Mr. these Mishad, issues. Mr. Massad, if this is not a win-win, it is not going to work. If it is a win-lose and it appears often to be just that, uh, then we are going to be stuck, and that is where the, where the borrowers and the homeowners are stuck well, now. Well, th th that is right, Congresswoman, and that is why I have said I think there needs to be a lot of attention paid to how this industry uh, has failed us in, in a lot of ways. We have seen a lot of problems coming out of this crisis. And, and uh, how your incentive structure has failed us. Right. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Would the gentleman suspend? The Chair would note that we are expecting two votes at approximately 1110. Uh, we will work for about one more question after the vote is called. We will we'll leave. We will return, and as soon as there are two people on the dais, we will begin questioning again so as to be respectful of your time. The gentleman may continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Borofsky and uh, Mr. Massad, for, for being here uh, to appear in front of us. Um, I had the uh, dubious distinction to uh, vote on TARP, uh, to vote against it, uh, I think for all the right reasons. I had the dubious distinction to be foreclosed upon by my electorate in the next election. And then for the last two years to hear the response of people who finally awakened to the fact that, yes, there was a problem, yes, there was a significant concern, yes, there was a meltdown that was taking place. But frankly, uh, their opinion was that it was the wrong approach to take, and it seems to have borne out. Mr. Massad, I, I would ask you, and I hope this hasn't been asked to while I was away at another committee meeting, but what are the plans for the obligated TARP funds which have not yet been spent? Uh, the only funds that have not yet been spent are those for the housing programs. And let me just note, it is not uh, $70 billion for HAMP. Uh, our portion of HAMP, there is a GSE portion, our portion of HAMP is 29. We have done a number of other housing programs. So there is $45 billion allocated for a variety of housing programs. There is still a very small amount uh, that is committed for the public-private investment partnership. Basically, uh, we are no longer making new commitments. We are no longer doing new programs. Our focus now is getting the money back. And we have gotten, as I say, a lot of it back, and I expect we will get a lot more of it back. And essentially, all the programs, uh, leaving aside the housing programs, all the programs considered as a whole will result in uh, very little uh, cost or potentially even a profit because we will get all the funds. Can back. you make a blanket commitment here today that those unobligated funds will? not be spent. There, uh, Congressman, I can make a blanket commitment to you that we will make no further commitments of funds. We do not have that authority. But let me make clear, the, 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 there are funds that are, that, are, that are obligated that may be spent. There are no, there are no funds that, we will, uh, that are unobligated. We will not make any further obligations of funds. But yet. you will not spend them, unobligated funds. Unobligated funds we will not spend. Uh, but I just want to make sure we are communicating. We no longer have authority to make obligations. I can't make new commitments of funds. I will not, therefore, make new commitments of funds. I do have, we do have some funds that have been committed but not spent, and those, you know, we expect at least some of those will be spent, not necessarily all of them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, on uh, page 6 of uh, SIGTARP report, uh, in referencing um, in comparing recipients of the Federal assistance uh, to Fannie and Freddie, um, you, you make this statement, in many ways TARP has helped to mix the same toxic cocktail of implicit guarantees and distorted incentives that led to disastrous consequences for the government-sponsored entities. 
based upon that statement, how are big banks who receive TARP money similar to those entities? Well, the two, yeah, the two of the big characteristics of what happened with the lead up to the, the, the conservatorship of Fannie and Freddie was, one, the implicit guarantee they received that they had a government backstop. And, and one of the legacy results of TARP is that the market still believes that the United States government is backstopping the largest too-big-to-fail institutions. And that causes a whole, a whole range of problems. Um, it, it hurts market discipline, counterparties, creditors, investors. They don't do the due diligence that is necessary when evaluating whether to do business with one of these banks or investing in one of these banks because they believe that, be, that, that there, any type of risk they take will be backstopped by Uncle Sam and the taxpayer. That gives them an advantage. It gives them the opportunity to borrow money more cheaply. Uh, S&P recently announced that their intent to change the rating system to make it as a permanent aspect that the big, too big to fail banks will have higher ratings based on implicit government guarantee. And they say this notwithstanding Dodd-Frank and other countries' response to the financial crisis. Um, this is a market distortion. Um, and as a result, the executives of those banks get back into the position where it is heads I win, tails the taxpayer but bails me out. What recommendations might you suggest to go away from that, that I think, moral, moral hazard? Uh, I think that under, where we are where we are, and what we have is, is Dodd-Frank and the, the, the FSOC and the committee that is providing oversight, and it does have a lot of tools. Um, they need to have both the regulatory will and the political will to, to rein in the size of these banks. They have to do two things which are going to be remarkably difficult, and, uh, and Secretary Geithner, to his credit, was remarkably candid with us about the limitations of what they will be able to do. But first of all, they have to have a system where it's, they can credibly resolve large financial institutions without bailing out the shareholders, the creditors, and the executives. Second, which is probably just as important, they have to convince the markets that that is actually going to happen. Uh, because if they don't convince the markets, if they don't have the credibility that they will not be bailing out institutions going into the, going into the future, it almost won't matter otherwise. Because, again, those incentives will still be warped. Uh, that discipline will still be gone. And those risks where, with the idea that the taxpayer will bail out, um, will bail out the, the executives, the shareholders, the counterparties, will continue a perversion of the system. Thank you. In, in the parent world, we call that tough love. Hmm. Uh, thank you. I thank the Can gentleman. I the Chair asks unanimous consent that a statement for the record submitted by the American Bankers Association be inserted at this time without objection. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this, this meeting. Mr. Borowski, I understand that you have the oversight authority to investigate mortgage service providers. I wanted to discuss. Uh, one specific example of a horrendous abuse against our active duty service members. According to an NBC News report of January 17, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company admitted that they overcharged thousands of active duty military families millions of dollars on their mortgages. They also improperly foreclosed on some of these families. Uh, they weren't supposed to do that because we passed the Service Members uh, Civil Relief Act specifically to protect military families from high interest rates and foreclosure actions. Uh, we recognize the importance of those family service to our country. Um, Mr. Massad, have you seen this report? I have, sir. Uh, what can these families do other than seek redress from the company? Uh, Congressman, I will be happy to look into that. That is really outside of my jurisdiction. But it was a very troubling report, I agree, and I would be happy to get back to you or get the appropriate officials to get back to well, you. Well, and, and I am glad to learn that J.P. Morgan has acknowledged his er errors and is mm -hmm. working uh, with the families to try and make things right, mm -hmm. starting by paying them back $2 million in overcharges uh, uh, interest. But this story makes me worry mm -hmm. uh, for a different reason. The victims in this case complained that the industry servicers, uh, in this case, harassed them endlessly, refused to acknowledge legitimate documentation when they presented it, and essentially made their lives miserable, uh, all without any basis to do so. Uh, now, I assume that banks don't have one collection agency uh, just for military service members 
and another one for everyone else. Uh, Mr. Borowski, have you seen similar abuses of this kind where the banks and their collection agencies harass people without any justification? We have, you know, we operate the SIGTARP hotline uh, where we have collected more than 24,000 contacts since, we, since our inception. And a lot of them are, are complaints uh, from homeowners dealing with, with mortgage servicers, absolutely. And when we see those, um, we, we try to direct them to the right place. If there is an allegation of criminal activity and it relates to the HAMP program, we will take it. If it is criminal activity that is outside of our law enforcement jurisdiction, we will refer it out. Uh, we will refer it to Treasury if it is appropriate, if there is some, some degree of uh, um, something that they can do. And we also collect them for our review and our audit function. How about the, the, the real abuse of servicers? Can they be removed from the program? I'm sorry. Can they be removed the, from, yeah, can from, they be re, re, from our program, from yeah. the HAMP program? Uh, they they could be. Um, again, you know, because there are some servicers that cover a lot of the market, and if we were simply to kick them out of the program, then we wouldn't be able to reach the people we'd like to reach. So that's why our focus has been to try to you know improve the practices as much as we can. Let me just say, you know. We will, we will continue to be aggressive in this. We are in the, the large servicer shops uh, you know, all the time, and we will continue to work with SIGTARP on, on practical constructions, uh, pra practical suggestions as to how to get the servicers to do a better job, because you know, we agree that they need to do a better job. Well, but if they are totally ignoring the homeowner and, and ignoring the documentation, then um, Sure. I, I, I wouldn't say they are if I may, Congressman, I wouldn't say they are totally ignoring the homeowner, at least with respect to our program. I think with respect to our program, uh, we have gotten them to pay attention. We have come a long way. When we started this, they said, you know, we can't do this. We are not, we're not ready. And we said, you've got to get ready. And while we, may, we haven't achieved as many modifications as we'd like, I will admit that. I have always admitted that. But nevertheless, we're, we're making some progress. We're still getting about 30,000 new uh, families helped a month. Uh, that's important. It may. It, it, it's not enough, mm -hmm. but it's important. Could uh, either one of the witnesses supply us with the breakdown of state by state of, of modifications? Would yes, we, we can certainly do that. We can do that for our program, Congressman. We we do produce a lot of statistics and, and metrics on our program, uh, but that only covers our program. There, frankly, aren't a lot of statistics on the rest of the industry in that regard. Okay, and and I, of special interest to me would, of course, be on Missouri. Certainly. Okay. I thank you. Thank the witnesses. And I yield back, Mr. I Chairman. thank the gentleman. Our last for this round before we go to votes will be the gentleman from Mr. Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Thank you. Um, being from Arizona and hearing of the discussion in regards to Florida and Ohio, um, I have to say that Arizona, which we thought was a leveling of, uh, of our, our problems with the housing, is now all of a sudden showing some signs of double dipping. Um, so this is very troubling. And being uh, from a very poor community from the district, uh, we see uh, homeowners on the very urge of our very brink of catastrophe. My question to you first, uh, Mr. Massad, is, uh, doesn't the lower cost of borrowing that results from the implicit government guarantee partially explain the bank's abilities to pay back TARP? Uh, yes, it's 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 probably a, a factor, but I think a more important factor was the process that we implemented of the stress tests, because what we did was we put the largest banks through a very intensive stress test because the market didn't have confidence as to which in institutions might fail and how much capital they needed. So in the spring of 2009, we implemented the stress test process, that, and we, and we made the results and the whole process very transparent. And as a result of that, they were able to raise uh, private capital, and we were able to get the government out. So in a follow-up question, so the success depends upon that implicit guarantee? No, I, I don't think I said that. Um, what I'm saying is that we got out of the bank's investments, we got the money back through this stress test and recapitalization process. I think, if I, if I may, I think the, the thrust of your question it really relates to some of the concerns Mr. Borofsky has raised on too big to fail and moral hazard. And those are very legitimate concerns. And this Congress obviously debated them at length uh, when it passed the Dodd-Frank legislation. 
Uh, we are still implementing that. I think Mr. Borofsky is, is raising uh, his views on that, that in effect it sounds like what he is saying is Dodd-Frank may not have been strong enough or may not be strong enough. Maybe we should break up some of these banks. Maybe we should take more aggressive action. That is certainly an opinion, uh, you know, and others have voiced that opinion. My own view is let's give Dodd-Frank some time to work because now we do have some, a lot of tools that we didn't have. Uh, so I think it is premature to say, uh, to, to, to pass judgment on uh, Dodd-Frank. It was really the first overhaul of our uh, financial system in many years, and it was, you know, it was necessary, uh, uh, or rather TARP was necessary, because we didn't have the tools that, uh, that Dodd-Frank provided. Mr. Borowski, how would you feel or would you differ in that opinion? Yeah, I don't think that Mr. Massett had, has correctly characterized my position, to put it mildly. Um, the answer to your question, though, is, is yes. The implicit guarantee absolutely enabled those banks to get out of, out of TARP on the terms that they did. Because those banks enjoy enhanced credit ratings from the credit rating agencies, part of the, one of the conditions that the Federal Reserve and Treasury put for those banks to get out of TARP was to go out of the markets and raise capital. And the larger banks can raise capital more efficiently and cheaply because of this implicit guarantee uh, because of the benefits they have. So, so in, in short, the answer to your question is yes. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Gosar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gosar. Um, and I am instructed that we are about to be called to some votes. So I am very, very grateful, both Mr. Massad and Mr. Borofsky, for your, for your uh, attendance to this point. I know there are, if you can, uh, give us the indulgence uh, as soon as we conclude the votes. I know there are some members who, who would like to continue with, uh, with some questioning. So uh, the committee stands in recess. Thank you.
there's a technical objection there, but I don't think. If we could all come to half order, because we are going to start again formally as soon as one more member arrives. Mr. Massad, if I could alert you to an inquiry that will occur before the end of today, and perhaps you could be more ready for it. Uh, officially, we are not back on the record uh, until, um, until the second member arrives, if you don't mind. Uh, but I want to make you aware of it so that you can be prepared to, to answer. As we began looking at, uh, if you will, the inflows and outflows and the perceived value, mark-to-market value of many of the assets, we noticed that the restating for last year, for the 2009, made it a, wor a worse situation, while the events this year made it a better situation, meaning that after the fact we made last year's deficit greater, but then substantially the same assets appear to have made this year better. So we have, I think it was $151 billion and $100 billion roughly. Uh, that, yeah, it is $154 billion fiscal, fiscal year 08 to 09. And, but the same accounting decrease uh, deficit uh, switched the other way by $110 billion. Okay, we are back on the record now. So just to make you aware of that, uh, and w our staff can provide you notes and then at an appropriate time answer the question. I didn't want anyone to be blindsided since this is something we began looking at just recently. Okay. I, uh, the committee will come to order. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, um, and, and thank you to the witnesses for for, for continuing to, uh, to be with us here today. Uh, Mr. Massad, I looked at something which is a little bit different than what has been talked about so far today, uh, but I noticed in my review of uh, the most recent report uh, the issue of uh, the extent where recapitalization isn't just for the big banks, but a lot of times you are looking at another of you know, groups of other banks and communities all across the country of various size. And some of them are looking at difficult issues as well and coming to you for recapitalization. So they are making application to you for recapitalization. What is your policy with respect to when you get that notification, sharing it with others? Congressman, thank you for the, for the question. You raised a, uh, an important issue. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't ever provide additional funds. I want to make that very clear. Secondly, our job now with respect to those bank investments is, is to get as much, money, as much of the money back as we can. We still have investments in about 560 banks. And there are a few of those situations where banks have had trouble and have come to us uh, because they are trying to attract private capital and they ask us to uh, modify our investment. And we have agreed in a small handful of situations. The, the biggest is obviously uh, Citigroup, where we agreed to convert from preferred stock to common stock. Uh, that one obviously turned out very well, since we will realize a $12 billion profit on our overall investment. Most of the others have been very, very small. Uh, but we do uh, try to work with the banks. We, we have a whole process of monitoring uh, our investments and monitoring these banks. And uh, you know, occasionally, because the bank is troubled, the choice for us is if we don't do anything, we might lose our entire investment because the bank might be seized. So the question is always, can we uh, agree to some terms that help them uh, attract new capital and therefore uh, realize as much as we can? And, and there is one of the issues, though, that, that, that struck my interest, because part of your participation with them is creating an awareness on others, in many ways, to some extent, maybe a sign of good approval that is enticing other private investors mm -hmm. to, to make capital investments to help with that bank. Now, one of the things that concerned me in the report was the suggestion that simultaneously some of these banks may be having trouble for a variety of reasons, including the potential that they may be looking at for fraudulent activities. So, so, so to what extent and what timing has been your policy to report that to the IG, who, who may, as you saw, 24,000 reports from people? 
as a prosecutor, I used to see the whistleblowers being some of the key things to us. They have information. What are you doing to assure that there are not activities in which you are enticing people to invest, but simultaneously they are under investigation for potential fraudulent activity? Right. It is a very good question. Uh, we, first of all, cooperate fully with SIGTARP in terms of when they tell us uh, they are investigating someone and they want information, we give them all that information that they want. Uh, I know that in the SIGTARP's quarterly report, uh, uh, Mr. Borofsky has raised the question of uh, whether Treasury should notify SIGTARP uh, when, uh, at some point in that process. And uh, that is a recommendation that we are looking at. We have, uh, from time to time, done that. And that is a recommendation that we are looking at. And may, may I, are, are, are you asking that SIGTARP say to you when they begin to have somebody under investigation? Uh, no, I am not asking that. That is what I am trying to understand. So, and I am not, not being hostileness. I am right. just trying to understand the timing here. Sure. Because the, the, the concern I have is, is that they may be sitting on information, investigative information, in which simply the fact that that would be leaked sure. would create, that would be contrary to sure. your interests. So, so the purpose they're, is, they're, I, yeah. I know my time is going to run out, so I'm going to ask you this. And Mr. Broski, if you can jump in at the conclusion of this after Mr. Massad and tells me what, what do you need, what is your policy with respect to the ability to have timely notification that you may have a matter under investigation while simultaneously Treasury is encouraging people to invest in that bank. Yeah. If, so, Congressman, if I may, it is a very uh, sensitive question, a lot of complexities to it, actually. And you have touched on many of them. And we have thought about this in connection with, well, what if the SEC is investigating a bank? What if the Justice Department is investigating a bank? Should that knowledge be knowledge that we have? If we have that knowledge, then what do we do? So there are some complexities to this that we are looking at. We are talking with uh, Mr. Borofsky's staff uh, uh, as well as the DOJ about this, and, and I will be happy to get back to you further on it. Thank you. Um, I don't think there is a great deal of complexity with this issue as respect to SIGTARP. We are a Treasury entity within the Treasury Department. Um, they used to give us a heads up before they would do one of these recapitalizations before they would be publicly announced, uh, which would give us an opportunity to review our caseload and, and communicate whether there is an issue. Um, and we have now made a formal recommendation that that, that process be implemented uh, and also that with respect to giving money in the SBLF program, you know, when TARP banks have an opportunity to recapitalize into the, the small business lending program that Treasury check with us, the last thing they want to do is pour more money into an ongoing fraud. One of our biggest successes was uh, with Colonial Bank, which had received conditional approval to receive $550 million in TARP money. And Treasury and, and Mr. Massett and OFS did a remarkably great job working with us to make sure that money didn't go out the door, and we want to have the opportunity to be able to repeat that success. Mr. Chairman, uh, one, uh, just to one Mr. follow Mr. consent for one more question. Just, um, if there was a policy where in the past they were and they are not now, what is different? Why has that changed midstream? Um, Congressman, there, there wasn't a formal policy. We, we, had, we had very few of these before. We did notify uh, SIGTARP, and, and we are looking at what should the formal policy be, because we also have to be sensitive to the fact that if, they, if, a, if a law enforcement official shares uh, information with us, we have to protect the confidentiality of that information. What, what position does that put us in? So, um, as I say, I think there are some complexities to this. I would be happy to meet with you and your staff to discuss it further. We are giving it very serious attention. Thank you, Mr. Mr. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Talk about good timing. Um, the best. <laughs> Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for appearing uh, before the committee today. Um, Mr. Massad, did the Bush administration make a mistake in creating the TARP program? No, I don't think so, Congressman. Uh, again, I, I think it was unfortunate that we had to create TARP. It was unfortunate that we didn't have the tools uh, to, to otherwise deal with this crisis. But I think they were right to take the actions that they took. I am proud of those members of Congress from both sides of the aisle who stood up and, and supported it. I think we needed this. And um, again, it is unfortunate that we had to do it, but I don't think we had much choice. Uh, at, at the time, Mr. Massad, the TARP was created by the uh, Bush Secretary of the Treasury, 
Mr. Paulson, um, were there not calls then and subsequently for the nationalization of the banking system in the United States? Uh, yes, there were. And, and did TARP offer a market-driven private sector alternative to those calls? Uh, yes, I believe it did. So despite heated rhetoric about big government takeover, actually, would it be fair to say, Mr. Massad, that TARP represented precisely the opposite? Uh, I agree, Congressman, yes. And again, uh, there were lots of concerns, and maybe, Mr. Borofsky, you want to comment, feel free to, uh, that uh, TARP was going to be this uh, endless uh, sucking sound that was going to, of course, suck up tax dollars and uh, inflate the Federal deficit uh, enormously. Uh, is that what happened uh, in the TARP program? I would be happy to answer that. I, no, I think that it is one of, one of the, the areas where TARP has succeeded uh, is been in the declining estimates of the financial costs of the program, absolutely. And what is the net cost currently of the, tar of the $700 billion that was originally allocated for TARP? It depends on, on who you ask. Um, CBO did an estimate. We, we have all three estimates in the most recent quarterly report. CBO's most recent estimate is, is in the area of about $25 billion. Treasury's most recent estimate is in the area of about $50 billion. Uh, OMB has a much significantly higher estimate, uh, but it is sort of dated back of, of May of, of 2010. It hasn't been updated yet. I anticipate that that number will come down uh, as well. But the uh, nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, on which this institution has historically relied, except recently when we apparently don't like their numbers, um, says $25 billion in that cost? $25 billion. And, and I think the, the reason for the, the big difference between their and Treasury's number is that CBO has looked at the HAMP program and basically doesn't believe that Treasury will pay, spend um, you know, even a fraction of the amount that it is allocated. Are there still warrants and stocks to be sold that could yet improve that net estimate of $25 billion negative? I am assuming that when CBO does its estimate, it considers those factors in, in, in fashioning its estimate. But I mean, of course, everything is about timing when you sell the warrants and stocks. Oh, of course. The markets could improve, which would be the losses will go down, or the markets could get worse, in which case the projected losses would get worse. Uh -huh. Okay. You mentioned the HAND program. Um, I seem to recall this committee having a hearing, I think, last year. And at that time, my friends on the other side of the aisle criticized the program, which they opposed. But they nonetheless criticized it because it only helped 167,000 Americans. Do I now understand that number is a half a million? Yes, I am sorry. Go ahead, Tim. Yes, that, that is correct, Congressman. That is the direct permanent modifications. Okay, and of course, so, yes. So this failing program nonetheless has managed to help more Americans. It's Sometimes I think of it as the little train that could. It keeps chugging along and helping people, yes. Now, at that hearing, uh, we had testimony from banks, and maybe, Mr. Massad, you are aware of this testimony, in which those bankers said that even the number at that time, which was 167, understated the reach of the program positively because a lot of banks were, in fact, helping homeowners because HAND existed and had created a standard they could follow. That, Would you comment? That, that, that's absolutely right, Congressman. Before we started HAMP, the servicers really weren't doing modifications. They weren't addressing this crisis. To the extent modifications were done, they often raised people's payments. And when HAMP came in, it, it provided some standards that the servicers have now emulated in their, in their proprietary programs. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac also adopted some of our standards for their uh, mortgages. So the indirect effect has been quite great. And you know, sometimes people talk about the numbers of foreclosures and so forth. If you look at the total number of modifications entered into since April of 2009, either under HAMP or under other programs, uh, it does outpace foreclosure sales, completions, if you will, by two to one. Again, it is not enough. I am always the first to say we haven't done enough, but you know, I think we are uh, making this crisis better, at least for me. I thank the gentleman. My time is up, and I thank the Chair. Uh, you are very welcome. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford, for five minutes. Thank you. I have a few questions. I wanted to just be able to get some clarifications, and thank you, gentlemen, for allowing us to be able to step out and vote and then be able to step back in as well on it. Uh, Mr. Massad, I am aware of some of the limitations that Dodd-Frank has placed on TARP. 
and the boundaries and the, and the new programs and such on it. Is Treasury willing to be able to assure us today that there is no plan, no intention that any TARP funds will be used for State pension bailouts or for State government bailouts uh, based on the limitations of, of what can be used in TARP? Yeah, yes, sir. Terrific. Just want to be able to get clarification on that. On page 1 of your report, um, on paragraph 4, it details out some of the numbers on it. Uh, the $410 billion dispersed to date, we have received back $270, representing $235 billion, $35 billion additional income. Approximately $166 billion remains outstanding. If I am running those numbers correctly, we are missing about $9 billion in that figure on that. And uh, so I didn't know if you would be willing to be able to resubmit to us just a, uh, a written update on that, where that other $9 billion and how that fits in there on that. Uh, I, I would be happy to do that, sir. I don't, I don't, I don't believe it's uh, nine billion, but I'd be happy to do that. Terrific. Yeah, just all, all those numbers, and when you add them together, the the quick detail out there, and I know that's just a very quick detail on it. Third thing is on the the auto industry uh, financing program. Uh, what is the plan at this point? You, you gave us a, a great statement on that. What is the plan for exiting out? We have gone from 61 percent ownership in stock to now 33 percent. That is terrific. That is making great progress, and thank you for that. What is the plan to take us down to zero percent? Uh, we are actively working on that. I want to be careful because of the securities laws. Sure. can't be too definitive about a timetable. But now that we have completed the initial public offering of GM, we do have a pathway to sell the rest of our shares. Right. And I would expect that we would sell all those, um, you know, hopefully within the next uh, two years, market conditions permitting. With respect to our other investments in Chrysler and Ally Financial, we are also working toward uh, initial public offerings of those institutions. Has Treasury set up a timetable on what they are looking forward to say by this date certain we are going to be out regardless? Or is this say, I, I don't want to, this is going to sound pejorative, playing the market with it to try to work it out. But is there some plan to say by this date certain we are going to be out? No, we haven't done that because we, I think we do have to be sensitive to a couple of things. Uh, one is market conditions, and uh, also in the case of the companies that aren't yet public, they really have to be ready to go public. We can't force them really to do that. But I can assure you that we're uh, trying to get out of all of these investments as quickly as possible. I firmly believe that our purpose, which is to promote financial stability, is best served today by getting the government out of the business of owning interests in private companies. I would, I would definitely concur on that one as well. Is Treasury, with that in mind, is Treasury still day-to-day -day in the operational business of GM, Chrysler, and allies? Is there still someone that is on board there with their stockholders and such that is helping advise? We monitor those investments, but we have never participated in the day-to-day -day management, and we have made it very clear that we will not do so, and we do not think that is an appropriate role for the U.S. government. Terrific. I would, I would agree on that one as well. Uh, Mr. Borowski's report details $59.7 billion that is av available that is sitting out there. Uh, and I am sure that, that number may move around some based on day-to-day -day operations on it. When, in your opinion, does TARP sunset? When, when do we not have hearings on TARP because TARP doesn't exist anymore? All available funds have now been returned and uh, there is no more TARP. What is the plan for that? Um, I would say on the investment side, again, we are trying to get out as quickly as possible. I, again, can't give you a timetable, but I think with respect to the remaining investments, which let us call roughly $170 billion, I think we will get most of that back in the next two years. There will be some portion that you know, we can't get back within that time frame. But we will certainly, uh, we, and we are, winding down the operation and uh, you know, trying to get out as fast as we can. Would, would it help at all to have a, a legislative solution on this, to set a timetable to say we're, the American people need some assurances that 20 years from now we are still not tarping, uh, that we are out there and that we have a time certain? Um, I, I don't think a legislative solution would be helpful because that could depress the value that we could get uh, for the investments that we have. Okay. But believe me, I don't intend to be here 20 years from now. Great. Uh, let me give you one last quick question on it as well. Uh, in Mr. Roski's report as well, it details out that the uh, five largest banks now control about 60 percent of gross domestic product. They are all 20 percent larger than what they were before the crisis on this. Uh, obviously, we have a heavy emphasis going in the largest of banks. I know you were talking about how the small and medium-sized banks are assisting as well, but the end result has been the biggest banks have grown bigger and they seem to be even more of a systemic risk. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been increased concentration in our financial system as a result of this crisis. I think uh, probably without TARP, that would have been even greater because we wouldn't have helped a lot of institutions that have been able to weather the storm. Uh, but the question as to whether it is too concentrated, you know, 
is certainly one that this Congress can take up. And, and as you know, Mr. Borofsky has, has properly noted, uh, that that is an issue uh, uh, that the Congress may wish to consider. I think what we have right now under Dodd-Frank are tools to try to regulate that. Uh, as the comment was made, some people have suggested nationalizing banks, some people have suggested breaking them up. Um, that is obviously uh, policy options that the Congress can consider. Sure. But it just seems to be that we have a preference for the largest of banks uh, in, this, in this structure and how we are going. I, I understand that my time has expired. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Walsh. For thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for coming in. It has been a long morning. Let me, uh, let me be very brief and ask two broad macro level questions, try to get an answer from each of you. Um, like a lot of my colleagues, I hear from community banks every day who are struggling. Uh, like a lot of my colleagues, I hear from community and small banks every day who resent the fact that it seems like TARP. Uh, the government sided with the big banks. Um, broad question, why are these community banks struggling? Uh, what is your biggest concern that you have got right now for community banks? Uh, that is a very good question. A lot of the, the, the smaller banks uh, do have loan portfolios that are more heavily weighted to the real estate sector, and therefore they have been hurt by that. Number two, they don't have access to capital as easily as the big banks. Uh, so those are very real concerns, and we have tried with the TARP program to address some of that. You know, the, the, essentially, when you look at the money invested in banks, about $250 billion overall under TARP was invested. About uh, uh, most of that, 234 or so, I, well, around that amount uh, was done under the Bush administration. I agree with the actions that they took, but I am just pointing out that they did that. $125 billion of it went to the largest institutions in the country. When Obama came in, uh, we have only invested an additional 11, million, 11 billion excuse me, in banks, and uh, a lot of that went to a lot of the smaller institutions, and we set up special programs to help them. Uh, but many of them are still struggling, and uh, we are trying to do our best to get this economy back uh, and get an economic recovery, get, a housing get the housing market stabilized, because I think those are the best things we can do for those banks. And Mr. Borofsky, why still this persisting struggle with the community banks? Part of it is, as, as Mr. Sad, Ms. Had uh, pointed out, to the structure of their loan portfolio, but a, lar a large part of it is also the continuing existence of too big to fail. Um, it gives an inherent advantage to the larger banks. There is a reason why the smaller banks don't have the same access to capital as the larger banks. Um, they don't have the access to the virtually free money from the Federal Reserve that the larger banks have. Larger banks, a lot of what has been a result of TARP and the related programs is it's given the opportunity for the largest banks to essentially earn their way out of trouble. And those are opportunities that are not available for the smaller and community banks. So maybe this leads then to my second brief macro level question. Give me, each of you, offer, offer one broad broad level critique of TARP, either with its implementation, with its design. If you were to each offer one broad critique of TARP, what would it be? Um, you know, if, if we had to do this all over again, and obviously mm -hmm. I'm assuming we, we will not have to, there are a lot of things we, we could change or would change, uh, Congressman. It's, it's hard to be specific. There are certain things in the housing program that we've done later that we might have done earlier. Um, I agree with the comment that was made earlier that, that it was proposed as a purchase of troubled assets, and then we, uh, you know, I think the Bush administration wisely changed course because I think they had to, but that obviously uh, contributed to, to some of the criticism. So it is things like that. There are many others I am sure that we would do over, but I think the key thing is, you know, hopefully now under Dodd-Frank we have the tools that uh, uh, will uh, make uh, this sort of thing unnecessary in the future. One overall critique, Mr. Borofsky. I think one of the things that could have been done better within, within the realm of possible and within the realm of what the TARP was, uh, was better transparency from the Treasury Department. From, from day one, this has been a recurring theme of our criticism, um, and we have been non, uh, very bipartisan in our criticism for both the, the, the Paulson Treasury Department as well as the Secretary Geithner Treasury Department. Um, but they're explaining this better to the American people. Uh, being more upfront and honest about these programs 
whether it was, was saying that the first nine institutions were all healthy and viable um, when they knew full well that some of them were not, uh, to some of the more recent statements, the cheerleading statements about the program, which under a little bit further examination certain things were left out. Um, I think that having a more transparent program, and, and it is not too late, and I would encourage Treasury to, to renew its efforts towards transparency, um, will help address some of the real negative views of this program. Because I think if people understand it and feel like that they are being that, that everyone is being upfront with them, um, it can be a more informed conversation, be a more informed debate. Right now, the Treasury Treasury's running of this program has been viewed of one I have heard, you know, picking winners and losers or backroom deals. Um, and all those criticisms really come out of these transparency failures. Yeah. Can I, if I may, sure. respond to that? Um, I, I am fully committed to transparency and, and the most of the particular suggestions that SIGTARP has made in this regard, we have implemented. Uh, I would just like to note, because I think often it's, it, people aren't aware of it, we publish annual financial statements which are audited and we have received clean opinions on these financial statements for two years without any material weaknesses. That is actually a very rare thing for a startup uh, entity. It is a, a relatively rare thing in government. We have publish a monthly report to Congress that lays out exactly where the money is, how much of it has come back, what is the status of the programs. We publish a transaction report on each transaction within two business days of completing it. We publish a dividend and interest report quarterly, which shows how much dividends and interest payments we have gotten. We put all of our contracts and agreements on our website. That means not only any contract entered into with a financial institution, but also all the procurement contracts, all the documents related to HAMP and any program we have, as well as program guidelines and other materials. Uh, we have testified before Congress uh, you know, numerous times. Uh, we meet. We have three oversight agencies, and we fully cooperate with them and give them all the information that they need. They have produced a total of 75 reports. Uh, so. We can always strive to do more, but I think actually there is a lot of information about this program uh, available. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very welcome. Uh, if anyone else arrives who has not had a first round, we will take them if they arrive before we finish. Otherwise, with your indulgence, we would like to have a brief second round for a couple of people. With, at this time, I would go to the ranking or the chairman of the subcommittee of jurisdiction, Mr. McHenry, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I would begin by uh, this has not been discussed greatly, but the moral hazard um, posed by uh, created by TARP is mentioned, Mr. Borowski, in your report. Uh, you've mentioned it before. This is certainly a big concern, um, Mr. Prasad. Um, S and P considers the likelihood of government support explicitly in their credit rating. Uh, are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that is a, a direct result of TARP? Um, I, I would say it this way, Congressman. I think because we didn't have the tools to deal with this rescue, we had to do TARP, and that does raise the moral hazard, too big to fail concerns that, that Mr. Borofsky has mentioned. But I think now Congress has addressed those through Dodd-Frank. We haven't implemented Dodd-Frank yet, but those are the tools we now have. So I don't think it's appropriate to blame it on TARP, uh, uh, but rather blame it on uh, uh, the fact that we didn't have uh, an adequate regulatory system, and that's what we're trying to improve now. I'd like to call up uh, the, uh, the Geithner slide, if I could. Uh, uh, Secretary Geithner and uh, uh, Ms. Borofsky, and, and your report on Citi, um, uh, outlines very clearly, in the future we may have to do exceptional things again if we face a shock that large. We just don't know what's systemic and what's not until you know the nature of the shock. Now, Mr. Borowski, was this interview post uh, signing of the Dodd-Frank law? Yes, this interview occurred in December of 2010. Okay. Uh, Mr. Massad, it, it seems that your testimony is counter to your boss's testimony. How do you reconcile that? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Uh, I think what Secretary Geithner was referring to, and you know, neither I nor, nor Mr. Borofsky were actually in the room, but um, But we have his and, words. Are, are, yes, are we do, and I've, and I've also spoken to him about this. What he was referring to was the ability to use the tools under Dodd-Frank to address this and the fact that we don't know exactly what the issue will be, but the right. tools under Dodd-Frank are flexible. We are not going to have just a set of immutable quantitative criteria 
that say, you know, if you are above this amount of assets, you are too big to fail. Sure. We have got okay. qualitative and quantitative. My, my next slide is uh, President Obama said last night in the State of the Union, because of this law, there will be new rules to make clear that no firm is somehow protected again, I am sorry, at the Dodd-Frank signing in, in July of last year. Um, he said th these, th these new rules uh, will make clear that no firm is somehow protected because it is too big to fail, so we don't have another AIG. Mr. Borowski, uh, it seems that Secretary Geithner's words run counter to that. Um, and it's hard to, after the fact, for his staff to say he didn't really mean it. Can you give us context for, for this? Sure. And, and, and a couple of things I want to make very clear. I, I was not in the room. I had six members of SIGTARP, including my deputy, were in the room. Um, and after we, we received this quote, we, we documented it. And as is the normal practice of our reports, we provided the quotes and a draft copy of the report to Treasury. Uh, both the quote itself and the context in which it was presented. And we had a number of conversations. They made some suggestions. We incorporated those suggestions. And at the end of that process, Treasury had assured us that they did not contest the language that was used, the quote itself, and did not think that we had presented it in, in any type of misleading or, or, or wrong context. So the quote is the quote. We stand by it. There is no question in my mind, um, and based on our interactions with Treasury before the report was released, that it is an accurate quote. Um, I think that, that Secretary Geithner, and it was the impression of the six people in the room, um, was being transparent, was being candid, and, and I commend him for that, um, by recognizing the reality that the market is today that banks are still too big to fail. Now, the hope is, is that if Dodd-Frank, and, and certainly Dodd-Frank has given the regulators many, many potential tools, um, and if those tools are implemented correctly, uh, and that is a very, very big if, um, it would require actions by the regulators that, frankly, um, they were, did not seem capable of doing in the run-up to this crisis as far as seeing around corners and understanding. But let's assume that they can. Um, hopefully, we can get to a day or a point where the government, you know, where the market will believe that the government doesn't need and will not bail out these companies, but we are not there. So uh, we know that S&P has made uh, the idea of a bailout, of TARP, uh, a TARP-like program, or Dodd-Frank, it is hard to really judge based on S&P making permanent their analysis of uh, really a Federal backstop to bail out the biggest firms. So we, we also know that there is uh, explicit guarantees uh, signed through contracts in 08 and 09 for these financial institutions, uh, of uh, whether it is the Fed, FDIC, or TARP, of a backstop uh, to um, uh, uh, get, well, government guarantees of assets. We know the explicit number, right? Yes. So the question to, to both of you is, can you uh, tell this committee uh, what you believe the net present value of implicit government guarantees are going forward to these financial institutions? There has been some studies, and I think we include one as a footnote reference in our report. Um, you know, we don't we don't have we don't do that type of economic analysis, but um, I think I saw one that was that suggested that it was um, and, and please don't quote me on this. I think a thirty four billion dollar a year advantage that the larger institutions have because of their ability um, to raise debt more cheaply than their smaller rivals. Um, that is one number I believe from one academic study that may be helpful. Mr. Massad, uh, certainly, uh, Congressman. I don't I don't have a an ability to quantify that on the spot, but let me just try to respond to your question. Um, in terms of explicit guarantees, I think you are referring to the Citigroup uh, Asset Guarantee Program, which has now been terminated at a profit to the U.S. Government, so there is no longer No, actually, that is not what I am referring to. Uh, there are actually, at the time of the economic crisis, as has been well documented, mm -hmm. uh, FDIC, the Fed, yes. TARP, Treasury has explicit guarantees through contracts that are publicly available. I am asking you about the implicit, and, and those are well known, well documented, we don't have to rehash them here. I am asking about the implicit guarantees. And Mr. Borowski, as he mentions in his report, if has. If the gentleman could summarize, right. conclude. So well, if you could. Yeah. Uh, well, but, but, it, but really, I think the, the, the thrust of your concern is have we addressed the too big to fail issue sufficiently? And I guess my response to that is the Congress passed the Dodd-Frank law to address that. If there is a view 
of some that that wasn't sufficient, that's a judgment for Congress to make. But I think where we are now, where Treasury is, is that we are actively trying to implement that law so that we can use the tools it gave us to make sure that no institution is too big to fail. And I think it is premature to conclude that it hasn't worked and that we need some tougher legislation uh, to address that. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the Ranking Member. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Massad, the Dodd-Frank legislation includes a, a number of provisions intended to eliminate the concept of too big to fail. For example, the legislation is clear that taxpayers will not cover the cost of saving failing institutions and will not cover the cost of liquidating uh, such an institution. Further, the legislation alters the Federal Reserve's 13-3 Emergency Lending Authority to prohibit bailing out an individual company. Finally, the legislation creates a Financial Stability Oversight Council to monitor systemic risk and to require non-bank financial companies that pose a risk to the financial stability of the United States to submit to supervision by the Federal Reserve. Can you describe briefly uh, how implementation of these measures will address the too-big-to-fail problem and what is the timeline for implementing the measures? Congressman, I can, I can describe that very generally because, actually, it is not my responsibility to okay. implement it, but I am happy to get the appropriate officials of Treasury to brief you. But my understanding where we are is the law was passed in July. There is a number of rulemaking procedures and studies that are being conducted. The FSOC holds regular meetings, and it always has a part of that which is public, and they are, they are busy working on these. They are also busy uh, creating the uh, Office of Financial Research, which is, which is designed to monitor uh, conditions uh, in the financial industry and help us determine what risks need to be addressed. But I would be happy to get you yeah, a more do. detailed briefing and we'll on follow the status. We will follow up with you with uh, some detailed questions, all right? And, and if you can uh, answer this, how will criteria be established to allow us to identify firms that pose systemic risks and are therefore systemically significant? I take it that you will do that in writing also? I, I can do that. I will say very generally that it is going to be, as, as has been announced, uh, quantitative as well as qualitative judgments. And the criteria aren't simply about size. They are about riskiness of activities, interconnectedness, extent of leverage, uh, extent of supervision. So I think these matters are being given a lot of thought. They are obviously very complex issues, but I would be happy to get you a more detailed uh, summary of where we are on that. Thank you. Let me, let me say this. I mean, I think that you all here, both sides of the aisle, uh, we are all very concerned uh, about HAMP, uh, Mr. Massad. And um, we also uh, are concerned about servicer behavior. And I understand that you and SIGTARP disagree about your authorities, but based on your understanding of your authorities, can you or, and will you take, a, take more aggressive steps to require improved servicer uh, performance? Uh, certainly, Congressman. I don't, I don't think actually we, we disagree with the extent of our authorities, but, but maybe there is just a difference in how we can best improve the program in terms of using those authorities. Do you all talk? But, but you yes, talk? We, we, we talk regularly. Okay, I just want to um, make sure. But, but let me just say, you know, this, this I want to make very clear while we think the benefits of these housing programs are very real and very important, we are still trying to improve them, still trying to reach as many people as possible. And it is not just HAMP. I mean, obviously, I statements that. have been made about HAMP. Most of the, a lot of the money goes to some of the other programs as well. But I think the key thing is the statement was made that, well, because uh, this hasn't gone as well as you'd hoped, or because there are these problems, we should simply turn it all back over to the servicers and let them let them deal with it. And I think that would absolutely be the wrong thing to do. That's what got us here. It's been clear, not just from our HAMP experience, but from the foreclosure irregularities issues and from a number of other standpoints that the servicers, that turning it back over to the servicers would not uh, be constructive at this time. There's two things. You, uh, you had talked a little bit earlier about retooling. I take it that there are things that you're doing now, you're in the process of doing, trying to improve the program to make it more effective and efficient. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. We've done a number of things. And, and, I think so, so, and I, I want you to give us a list of those things. And when do you expect them to be complete? 
I mean, we, I'm running out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it, it's an ongoing process. As we see problems, we respond to them. But, for example, some of the things we've recently done is we've addressed the fact that servicers might have been considering someone for HAMP at the same time as they were foreclosing. We've addressed the fact that initially, you know, we started this program by trying to get a lot of people into trials and we didn't make the servicers verify the income. That obviously led to the fact that a lot of people then didn't get into permanent trials. We have addressed that and we have worked through the backlog. So it is an ongoing process. I would be happy to give you a list. Let me ask you this. One of the things that I said to the Chairman, and I, and I really want to thank him for this, we talked about how do we make our agencies more accountable. And um, if you are doing things that are going to improve this program, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we bring Mr. Massad or somebody from his agency back on the level, that level of authority at a certain date to give us a report as to exactly where they stand, because I think we, we are, you have said it and I have said it and we all agree that we do want accountability. I don't want to see the, the, the program ended, but, I mean, if you are telling us that you are doing things to improve the program, I don't, you know, I want to know. I want you to tell us when you can come back to us and, and give us some more information so that we can have some confidence because both sides of the aisle are quite frustrated, to be frank with you. Certainly, Congressman. Happy to do that. Uh, and in response, uh, if you will commit to give us monthly updates next month and the following month, we will commit to have you back in your next quarterly report if that works for both of you. Uh, that is fine. Mr. Chairman, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. That I yield back. I thank the gentleman. In closing, I have just a couple of questions, and these can be answered for the record because they, they tend to be perhaps a little complex. Uh, today we have talked specifically about uh, TARP. That was the subject. We got into HAMP. My understanding is that HAMP, of course, is shared with another piece of legislation, HERA. Uh, it has joint funds. We, got into, we did not get into the $30 billion of obligated and how that scored and all of that. If you would, and I know Mr. Borowski has a very thorough quarterly report, but if you would try to create before this next 30-day uh, update a good analysis so the members can have your interpretation of outstanding funds, meaning, and this is a question for Treasury in consultation with the Fed, obligated funds remaining at the Fed, because we are not the Financial Services Committee, so you will have to give us a little primer from time to time looking at the funds committed under other programs, including HERA, uh, because I think that will help us understand where is the money still remaining out that is either obligated or literally out. Uh, and that will help us 30, 60, and 90 days from now. It is very clear that we do still have major credible agencies that believe too big to fail is leading them to having more success in loaning money at a lower amount. That is a challenge for small banks, and we certainly would like to work as a committee to ensure that, as Dodd-Frank is in, uh, put into action, that that leads to a fading away of that, as the President had promised uh, at the time of its signing. We also didn't talk about, and I would like this included in your report uh, or briefing sheet, the approximately $145 billion that I believe is gone forever to the GSEs, the, the actual failure rate, which often is, as we are talking about the success of TARP, we are forgetting about Freddie and Fannie's actual losses that we have backstopped as a nation. One thing that I would appreciate, which is uniquely to Treasury, most of us here in Washington who have been in business have tried to convert from GAAP over to understanding the Federal Government's sort of pay-as-you-go accounting. Now, at Treasury, you are a little different. You are a hybrid. And so as I looked through a report, which I believe our people have furnished you with, just a report internal that we developed, if not, we will, I began seeing the accrual system of reserves come into play in a way that, as a public company uh, officer, I, I always question, okay, you had reserves. Or you had you had a stated value, a mark to market value. You r went back and stated them, restated them in this year for the previous year, and they got worse. However, in this year, they got so much better that there's this 154 billion to 110 billion dollar swing. And we'll give you our source material because it may very well be that you can clarify it to where we understand it's simpler, not more complex. But I think it's important because, as I understand it, those numbers 
reflect a, a re really reflect on the anticipated deficit and other figures that, that we, we look at. And I think all of us want to know the true deficit in 2009, the true deficit in 2010, and so on. Uh, but actually, we don't want to know it. We would like it not to exist. But we would at least ha like to have the accurate numbers for them. The, uh, <clears throat> lastly, uh, a request. Today we have been talking in net dollars. Before we talk again, I would like the committee to have source material that you, preferably you two very much agree on, uh, in the way that a normal business would do it, meaning you, rep you represent a profit from investments you made, loans you made, warrants, et cetera, that have been realized. Those do not go as an offset against other bad deals. We are not looking for your net profit. What we would, I believe, like to see is where you put the money in and what you lost, where you put the money in and what you gained. And so effectively what we are saying is scrape off the profits and put them in a pile from the good deals. But any time a particular basket, meaning a company or an entity, had a loss, we would like to see those losses. Because I think when we are evaluating what worked and didn't work in this program that never did what we anticipated but did something very different, it is important, I think, for all of us to see, okay, loans to solvent entities in certain forms worked, other things not so much. Uh, and obviously some of these you can't answer because General Motors and Chrysler are projected but not yet final. But we will take the projection. Lastly, I would like to take the liberty quickly in closing of reading what is uh, a draft, but we believe will be the final mission statement, uh, because as a, a private sector guy, I figure at some point when you take over as CEO, the first thing you have to do is make sure your mission statement to your people matches what you would like to, uh, to see. And because this is our first hearing, I would like to read it. Americans deserve to know that money Washington takes from them is well spent. Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our job on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to help Americans secure these rights. Our task is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to with citizens dash watch watchdogs to deliver facts to the American people that bring reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission statement. Hopefully we began today by asking you, as you have done, to help us in that effort. I thank you and we stand adjourned. Thank you.